Hello, everyone. Nice to see you on my channel, Touching Stories. Today you will hear an amazing story that is based on real events. It's a drama that will be a very important lesson for everyone. He had been walking down the long corridor of the maternity hospital for two hours. Harvey had brought his wife in. She was very weak. The doctors hadn't advised her at first, and then seeing her persistence had forbidden her to give birth. With her heart condition, it was tantamount to murder, but she convinced the doctors, I feel everything will be all right. My intuition has never failed me before. When her husband brought her to the hospital, the doctors asked just in case, Harvey, anything can happen. You know your wife's health. So I'm asking you now, who do we save if something goes wrong? Of course, do you think she can't handle it? A grown man asked in a frightened voice, Harvey, with your wife's health, anything's possible but we'll keep our fingers crossed. It was out of the question that Lucy would give birth on her own, so only a C-section. She was covered in sweat, small curls stuck to her forehead. She tried to say something, but she had no strength. She was breathing often, and you could tell from her lips that she was asking, soon. Her beautiful long fingers dug into the snow-white sheet, and she bit her lips so painfully that blood dripped from them. A heart medication was injected into her vein, she began to breathe more evenly and said she felt better. She was given anesthesia and labor began. When the first girl was taken out, the instruments showed cardiac arrest. She became violently ill. A cardiologist was by her side who knew what medications she was tolerating and what needed to be administered to make the labor successful. Everything they could do was done. When the doctors realized they were losing her, they began to save the second girl. Two tiny droplets, similar to each other, came into the world on Christmas Day. God gave them life, but took the life of their mom. The father was inconsolable. Life with his Lucy had been a blessing. Soft, kind. She loved her husband and was devoted to him with all her aching heart. It was a model family. The sisters took a nanny, a woman about 50 years old, who was with the children inseparably. They named the girls almost identically, Victoria and Veronica. And since Veronica was too long to pronounce, she was Veronica at home. The nanny quickly learned to distinguish them because she knew one little secret. Victoria, the older by five minutes, had a small mold behind her right ear, and the younger Veronica had exactly the same, but behind her left. She said this to Harvey, but he was even more confused. He tried to be home less. There wasn't much dad could do for the girls yet, so he plunged headlong into work. He was obliged to provide his princesses with a trouble-free future. So the first thing he did was to buy a huge plot of land outside the city and start building a big house. He wanted it to be a family nest for the girls to live here with their families. With this in mind, he built a house with two entrances. He decided that Victoria had a mole behind her right ear, so her entrance would be on the right and Veronica's would be on the left. Then everyone laughed at this idea but when, after three years, the mansion was built, everyone saw just a castle for princesses. The entrance consisted of two entrances. Above each of them were monograms in the form of the letters B and H. It was very unusual. When you walked through those doors, there were two beautiful staircases, right and left, leading up to the second floor. Harvey tried to make everything in the house so that his girls would be comfortable. Seventeen years passed after the events described above. The father did not dote on his girls. His life he never settled, did not find a woman who at least a little would be like his Lucy. Daughters grew up beautiful and father was concerned about the increased attention from the male population and he thought that they should be less at dubious events. If we talk about the characters of the girls, then better than a poet and cannot say, ice and fire. The eldest Victoria was daring, mischievous and prone to adventure. The huge world mesmerized and beckoned her to herself, which cannot be said about Veronica. Victoria was told by a gypsy that she was not created for family life, but for festivity and splendor, that her life would be full of adventure and loss, to which she replied that she didn't believe in that nonsense. She was very beautiful. This beauty was so bright, even bold. Despite her still very young age, she had the alluring look of an experienced woman and seductive plump lips. She was not shy to charm and seduce. She never went unnoticed. When not seen by her father, she painted her already seductive lips with bright red lipstick. 
Combined with her black hair, it looked a little vulgar, but there was no man who would bore his eyes away from her. She saw it, knew it, and sort of teased them by saying, Yes, I am so beautiful, but I am not yours. I am not so easily obtained, and only your glance is very little to be with me. But for all that, she was an excellent student. She read a lot, and her tongue was so strong that even her father couldn't talk over her. Victoria kept everyone in suspense. Once, the chauffeur who drove him to work came to his father and said that there was no car in the garage. There was no one to take the car except Victoria. When Veronica heard the roar of an approaching motor, she jumped out of the house and ran up to the garage. They stared at each other, one completely displeased with her sister's behavior and the other satisfied that she could get away with it. So, where did you learn to drive? Veronica asked her. But Victoria laughed merrily that her joke had succeeded. From the outside, it was striking that, despite the difference in the expression of their beautiful faces and the apparent recklessness of the older sister, they were alike as two drops of water. Looking at each other, it was as if they were looking in a mirror. Veronica's character was completely different. With the same facial features, with the same plump lips, she was modest, quiet like her mother. She was domestic, the kind you dream of marrying, intelligent, beautiful, modest, she had in her blood the care of her family and friends. Veronica was content with her home, her family, and following their traditions. The sisters were always very close. The girls loved each other very much, and Veronica was always pulling her older sister out of yet another trouble. She always found a reason to justify Victoria, and without hesitation, took on her guilt. Their father often lectured them, teaching them to be serious and responsible, even when temptations were great. Everything about them was unusual, and sometimes it seemed to those around them that there was one person in front of them. But deep in their hearts, they realized that there were many differences between them. The girls finished school, and then their roads diverged. Victoria wanted to enter economics, and Veronica wanted to become a teacher. Why do you need this pedagogical school? Always these screaming children and miserable salaries you have to go where after studying you can get a good job or even in the firm with my father, but teachers are not needed there. Think about it, dad won't last forever, who's going to take care of the business? I don't know anything about business, why would I go into it? You don't have to know anything about business, you can go to law school and then go to your dad's firm in the legal department. That's not helping the family business. At the family council, it was decided that Veronica would go to university to study law and Victoria to study economics. So the girls went to the same institute, but to different faculties. As soon as Victoria appeared at the faculty, she immediately divided everyone into two camps, outspoken enemies and the same outspoken admirers. In the first group by the law of the genre was all female students and in the second almost all young people except those who considered themselves not worthy to be next to such a beauty. But strangely enough, the teachers were also divided into two camps, female teachers and they were the majority noted to brazen appearance, hyper-confidence, frank outfits and very beautiful appearance. But to be fair, they also noted her sharp mind and wit. The first course of the economic faculty practically repeated school subjects, so Victoria did not bother with preparation. She had straight A's in all seminars and credits. That increased the number of envious people and therefore enemies. She was not afraid of it. She clearly knew what she wanted and went to her goal. In the second year, special subjects were added and one of them was financial management. Entering the auditorium, the teacher looked around the group. On the second row, his attention was attracted by a searing brunette who was looking at him with interest. Hello, my name is John. I will be reading your course financial management. The course is designed for the whole year in the summer session exam. There are no books on the subject, so the main source of knowledge on the subject will be my lectures. I have everything so far. If you have any questions at the end of the class, I'll answer them all. And he began the lecture. Victoria wrote something down, but mostly looked at the new teacher. He was a man about 35 years old. She noted that he was only 17 years older than she was tall and handsome. He reminded her immediately of the artist Kevin Costner. The resemblance was uncanny. She looked at him without taking her eyes off, which was very embarrassing. He noticed a beautiful brunette. It was hard to take his eyes off her too. 
but he was more experienced than this girl and could hold his own. He was clearly attracted to her. At the end of the lecture, John, as promised, asked for questions that he was willing to answer. Everyone remained silent, but Victoria decided to ask, Tell me, has anyone ever told you that you look like the artist Kevin Costner? Everyone laughed. A little off topic, but I'll answer, so that you no longer tormented by this question. Yes, it has been said, and more than once, I myself also noticed some similarities, but the most minuscule. Yes, indeed, said Victoria. You are much more interesting than he is not embarrassed at all, she finished. Thank you for your kind words, but that's the end of the matter. If you are not interested in anything else, I will say goodbye. She hadn't written down the lecture, so she took the notes from Billy, who was the one who had been the most helpful to her. He was outwardly a very interesting guy, but he was too small for her. He tried to please her. He was her slave. And what she needed, with her temperament, was a man. Six months passed. In that time, Victoria had learned a lot about her favorite man. And the fact that he had become her favorite, she did not even doubt. He was not married in this place, she sighed with relief. He had a rented apartment. After the institute internship, he was abroad and lived there for two years. She had enough of this information, the main thing in which was that he was free. And she launched an offensive, not thinking about the consequences. The sisters went to university by car Victoria was driving. By this time, she had finished driving courses and was very confident behind the wheel. It was obvious that she liked to drive, but as a person who was fond of driving, she had exceeded the speed limit more than once, but in some surprising way, without implicating her father, she dealt with the situation on her own. The winter session was coming up, and Victoria wasn't nervous at all, because there was no subject that would be difficult for her. She couldn't think of an excuse to be alone with John. But one day she got the idea to slash his tires and offer her services, a ride home. She asked a local gang that always hung out around the corner for a smoke and a beer. After paying a little and showing the car to the victim, she calmly went to lectures. Coming out of the uni, she saw John cutting circles around the car and bemoaning the three flat tires. Victoria said in surprise, Who did you guys hurt so badly? I was thinking the same thing. There were no credits, no exams. No other way, as someone fell in love and thus explained in love with a smile, said John. You say it so confidently, as if it was not the first time. No, it's not. It is. I was going to offer you a ride home, but now I don't know. You'll think I did it on purpose to get you in the car. That's exactly what I think, but I'll ask you to drive me home, but please wait, I'll call a tow truck. She was so embarrassed that he figured her out in a heartbeat. They rode in the car and were silent. Where should I take you? Victoria asked. He gave the address. As they drove up to this house, she didn't want to leave him. He felt it. He had the same desire. But John knew it was wrong, that she was still a child and he shouldn't go along with his feelings. He was an experienced man. He had been with women. He knew his way around them. But in this case, he knew he had to stop. Victoria was waiting for John to say thank you and leave. So ahead of him, she asked, what are you going to pay with? What do you need? I can offer money. And he saw her pretty face wrinkle. I can buy you a coffee. There's a lovely cafe around the corner. She shook her head, showing him that it wasn't that. Then you speak up. I'll do it. Are you sure you'll do it? And she had the courage to say, kiss me. She did not take her eyes away, but looked straight at him. She had the tantalizing look of an experienced woman, her bright lips attracted like a magnet. He wanted it too, but the fruit was forbidden, and that fueled the passion even more, and he couldn't stand it. He pulled her to him gently at first, just touching her face and lips, and began to cover her with kisses. He realized from her reaction that this was her first time. He knew how to bring a woman to ecstasy, and when he felt she was all his, they merged in a passionate kiss. She was dizzy with happiness. She didn't even realize it could be so pleasurable. When he wanted to let her go, she didn't let him, wrapping her arms around his neck and pulling him against her. Veronica loved going to law school. She thought she would regret her career as an educator. But no, she loved college life. Despite the fact that she was as beautiful as Victoria, she had friends, appeared girlfriends, on the background of which her beauty was even more expressive. She was respected by teachers for her intelligence, poise, 
and excellent academic performance. Many boys liked her, but she herself was not in a hurry with relationships. Her favorite phrase, all in due time. The second course brought a lot of new subjects, new difficulties, yes, a lot of new things. Veronica sat at the textbooks to understand it all, and once she saw it, her father offered the help of his lawyer, who works at the firm. He will explain everything to you in simple, accessible language, and examples will be given. Don't say no. It's real help. Veronica was glad for any help, so she agreed. Just before the session, a young man of about... <laughs> University to support her. When she came out with the credit card, where the mark excellent, he wrapped her in his arms and congratulated her. Flowers appeared from somewhere, which raised the girl's mood even more. They went for a walk along the embankment. The weather was beautiful. They wanted to sing and shout with joy. Nanny invited her to a cafe. They drank a glass of champagne, drank coffee, ate ice cream, and Veronica felt so tired that she asked Nanny to take her home. At home, she collapsed into bed and didn't get up until lunchtime the next day. She hadn't seen Victoria in a while, so she went to her room to chat. Her sister was still asleep. She laid down next to her and Victoria woke up immediately. Hi sis with such warmth and love, Veronica said. Hi Veronica, how are you doing? How's the session? Victoria asked before she opened her eyes. I'm fine, I'm passing the session with honor so far. I wanted to tell you that I think I'm in love. What? It's like a dream come true. Who is he? Where'd you meet him? My sister was so forward. This is Nanny, dad's lawyer. He's been helping me study for my exams. Yesterday, he came to cheer me on. And when I got an A, he gave me flowers and invited me to a cafe. He's so gentle, so interesting, and I feel he likes me too. What do you see in that boring guy? I think he's so boring. He's a drag. Veronica stood up abruptly and left her sister's room. She's so abrupt, only her opinion is considered unquestionable. She had never learned to consider others. If she likes something, take it out and put it, and others do not care so thought offended Veronica, wiping her tears. But Victoria was already running after Veronica to apologize. She realized that she had overreacted. She had gotten too personal and should apologize to her sister. Veronica, honey, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Well, why are you so upset with me? You know me. The tongue is my enemy. I'm sorry. I love you very much. You couldn't hold a grudge against her for long. She was such a suck up. Could find such words in her excuses that Veronica couldn't help but forgive her. I also want to tell you something important and very secret and Victoria told her about John, which made Veronica speechless. You're crazy. He's a teacher. How are you going to face him in lectures, credits, and exams? He's twice your age. He should be married long ago, and you're still a child. Victoria, you've upset me. I'm going to be worried about you from now on. What a grown man needs from a young girl, don't you know? I know Victoria replied firmly. I need it too. I love him and I'm ready for anything. And if you get pregnant, what will you do? This is very serious, sister, so before it's too late, in this relationship, you're as boring as your nanny. You don't realize that the heart doesn't understand orders. You stop loving him. That's all. It can't be commanded. It loves and is ready for any sacrifice explained to her sister Victoria. After the conversation on Ray's tomes, they went to their rooms. Veronica thought about nanny again, remembered every detail of their walk, and did not agree with Victoria that he was an uninteresting person. 
He seemed to her to be a well-read, cultured man. It was just that he and Victoria had different tastes. Victoria was eager for a closer relationship with John. She gave him a few more rides home while this car was being repaired and each time she said goodbye, he paid her back with a kiss. Each time they became even more passionate and prolonged, which fueled the passion between the young people. But John knew how to step on the throat of his own song, and that was the end of it. Victoria was angry with him, but she couldn't help it. He wouldn't invite her to his house, citing the mess of not having a woman's hand in the house. The second year was coming to an end and the financial management exam was coming up. Victoria was ready for it and was not worried at all. She heard whispers behind her back that John was going to give her an A, but she ignored them. When she took the ticket, she didn't even prepare for it, but decided to answer at the blackboard. She answered perfectly. Everyone who sat in the audience mouths dropped open. For the sake of order, the teacher asked her a few questions, which she answered. Another A adorned her report card. When she left the building, she decided to wait for John, but she saw his car, which meant he wasn't going with her today. Maybe she should slash the tires again. She felt funny that she couldn't think of anything more interesting to do. Getting into the car, she drove home. When John's exam was over, he felt very tired, but after taking a breath of fresh air, he perked up. Noticing that there was no Victoria's car in the parking lot, he felt sad. He would have liked to see her, to praise her for her excellent knowledge. He realized he missed her. Without expecting himself, he decided to call her. Victoria, I wanted to praise you for your excellent knowledge. I am pleased that you love my subject. First I loved you, and then the subject, Victoria replied. You are also my favorite student. I've never had one and probably won't have any more, John said sadly. It's like you're saying goodbye to me, Victoria asked. Yes, I'm going abroad tomorrow. I won't be back until September. So goodbye, Victoria. And what are you going to do abroad? My parents are there. They're not young anymore. I have to visit them. Can I come with you? I'll rent an apartment, and in my free time, we'll go for walks, and you'll show me the local beauties. How do you like my idea? Am I good? I don't think it's a good idea, because I won't have time to go out with you. I'll be busy. Where are you going? Spain. Really? We have a house in Spain. I won't even have to rent an apartment. I'll live at home. What city are you in? He didn't want to tell Victoria. Besides his parents, he had friends there and not just men. Natalie was the one he had a serious crush on. She was a serious and very sweet girl. He liked her. John's mom wanted them to be together. That's why pretty Victoria was going to be a big part of it. No, Victoria, I'm sorry, but no, we don't need to see you. I get it. You have a woman you're going to see, and I'm in the way. Is that it? She was afraid to answer. Yes, Victoria, you're right. And besides, you and I aren't exactly a couple. I'm much older than you. You still have a long way to go. Goodbye. Tears were dripping from her eyes. She couldn't see anything and stopped to avoid an accident. I'm still going to Spain, and tomorrow too. I have my passport and tickets are no problem. Her mood immediately improved and she went home. When she went into her father's office, she told him she was going to Spain tomorrow. She would have a vacation, swim in the sea. She had an excellent session and deserved a vacation. Harvey didn't mind. Veronica didn't mind either. There was only one flight to Spain for tomorrow, and the tickets were booked for it. Even from a distance, she saw John, but she didn't want him to see her. Since they were business class passengers, they boarded without waiting in line and they had a separate minibus that took them down the runway, and they got on the plane first, because John was flying economy class and they didn't meet. When they got in the air, Victoria told her sister why there was such a rush. She told her that John was on the plane, also going to Spain. She asked her sister to go to their house alone, and she would come over later. She should see where John was going. Veronica disagreed for a long time, but it was useless to argue with Victoria. She ran after John so as not to lose sight of him. He was met by a girl, small in stature, a little pudgy pretty, but she was a long way from me, she thought arrogantly. Maybe it's a sister or an acquaintance. They walked to the bus and Victoria kept up. When they got off the bus, they immediately ducked into a cab. While she was looking for a car, they had already driven away, but she told the cab driver which car to follow. 
It was getting dark, and when her car stopped, she saw that a completely different person had gotten out of the car they were following. The cab driver had mixed up the cars and followed the other one. Victoria looked around. Everything was unfamiliar. The cab driver was gone. What should she do? The neighborhood didn't look like a rich one. There were small houses around, and she realized that she had to get out of here quickly. She walked in the direction where the cab had gone. She wanted to ask how to get to the bus, but she didn't meet anyone. A group of young men and girls were walking towards her. She asked them how to get to the bus, but she didn't remember anything else. She woke up in a dirty shed with a headache and a terrible smell. It was as if there was a toilet nearby. When her eyes got used to the darkness, she realized she was in a shed with a hole in the roof and a toilet pit next to it. She wanted to get up, but her legs were tied with duct tape. She didn't have her phone, money, or purse with her. Her hands were stiff from the duct tape, so she tried to tear it with her teeth and free herself. When she freed her hands and started to untie her legs, at that moment a man entered the shed and explained in broken English that she should not hurry anywhere. They had her passport, phone, and money. Where did we get such a beautiful girl from? I'm from the United States. Let me go. No, we need such a bird ourselves. You'll work and give us the money, but if you dare to run away, we'll catch you and spoil your pretty face. You'll be in trouble. They're already looking for me and they'll find me. So you better let me go. I can give you money. I have a rich dad. If I call him and he'll send it to me. Give me the phone and you'll be rich. No, pretty girl, you'll earn us more with your sweet spot than your daddy will pay us once. So wait for the owner to come and decide. She realized she was in deep shit. And for the first time in her life, he didn't know what to do, so she was scared. When she couldn't wait for Victoria by nightfall, she called Harvey. Daddy, something's happened to Victoria, I can feel it. Come quickly, I can't do it alone. Harvey left on a private flight with the security guys. They had worked in intergroups many times and had solved such complicated and intricate cases that Harvey had no doubt they would help. They figured out faster because they knew what they were doing. Veronica met her father in tears, saying the same thing all the time, that Victoria was in danger, that she could feel it and had to hurry. She was taken to show the place where they had parted with Victoria and where she had gone next. After inspecting the place and seeing the many video cameras, they drove to the Spanish police station. After examining the footage, they saw Victoria getting on a bus. They followed the route of that bus, then examined other video footage. There was a clear view of Victoria catching a cab. After looking at the license plate number, they quickly found a cab driver who remembered well where he had taken the beautiful girl yesterday. Half an hour later, they were there. The cab driver, looking around cautiously, said in broken English to look in the barns in the yards. And here the Spanish police refused to help, saying that the girl was an adult, had come here on her own. No one had forced her to come here, and they would not bring people in for who knows what. Harvey offered them money and a lot of it, but they left. The boys decided to act on their own. There were a great number of shabby houses, no different from the barns in the yard, but not so that they could not be examined. It was nearing the end of the day, and the search yielded nothing. Veronica kept calling and asking how things were going, but her father, unfortunately, could do nothing to please her. Sitting down on a bench, they decided to make a plan of further actions if they did not find Victoria in these barns. Suddenly, they saw five men come out of the farthest shed, which they had not yet examined. When they were out of sight, the boys rushed in. The barn was dark and smelled terrible, but they saw Victoria. She was huddled in the corner, screaming in English, Don't come near me. Then they called Harvey, and she recognized him and started crying hysterically. They brought her out into the light. She was all bruised and bloody. She'd been beaten, her clothes torn, and she'd been raped. We decided to go to the police station and show them what had been done to an American citizen. Oddly enough, the police were not surprised and said, She came voluntarily to this criminal neighborhood. No one dragged her there. She knew what might be waiting for her there. How could she have known what was waiting for her? She was looking for a friend. Why didn't she take the same cab back to the city? She saw the neighborhood she was in. She came here on purpose to find adventure. If she'd been kidnapped, There'd be a crime, but here we don't see a lineup. Do you think it's normal for a girl to be in this condition? 
If she enjoyed the adventure, she wouldn't have resisted. She would have satisfied everyone. And she wouldn't have been beaten up like that. But she was raped. Is that normal in your country? Harvey wanted to leave the police station as soon as possible and come home. Veronica met her sister in tears and wanted to hug her, but Victoria pushed her away and ran to the bathroom. Two hours passed, but the sister did not come out. Everyone started to worry and knocked on the door. Finally, the guys broke the lock and went into the bathroom. Victoria was lying there and staring dumbly at the ceiling with completely lifeless eyes. There was nothing like Victoria had been two days earlier. When she finally got out of the bathtub and changed her clothes, her father decided not to stay here any longer, but to go to the United States, Victoria would need good psychological help, and maybe even the help of a psychiatrist. At home, she locked herself in her room, refused to come out for 24 hours, refused to eat. The father called their house doctor, a fairly elderly woman with a lot of experience. She should be seen by a gynecologist to check for pregnancy, take tests to make sure she hasn't contracted any diseases, and definitely a psychologist. I will recommend you a very good specialist who pulled people out of terrible situations. Good, of course, not much, but do not worry. She is young, healthy, time will pass, and she will come to her senses. She refused to go to the doctor. She was hysterical. So another week passed, but her condition did not improve. The doctor Naomi said to give her sleeping pills and take her to the doctor. It's her health. Don't procrastinate. Harvey had arranged with the doctor in advance, and when Victoria was brought in, she was immediately admitted, examined, and tests were taken. Blood was taken immediately from a vein so that the tests would be more accurate. When Victoria woke up, she was already in her bed. There was nothing worse than waiting. Veronica was very nervous for her sister. She shrank, never left the house, and kept waiting for Victoria to call her to her bedside. Three days later, they received a call from the hospital saying that the tests were ready. Veronica went to the hospital and from there to Naomi to see what the test said. After seeing the test, the doctor reassured Veronica, she is not pregnant already well. There are no STDs. It is too early to check for AIDS. In a month and a half, we will take a second blood test. So everything is not so bad. Now we can take care of her moral state. Veronica told all this at home. Everyone cheered up a bit. The news wasn't bad after all. Naomi gave the phone number of the psychologist and told her not to delay with his invitation to Victoria. It had been a week since Victoria had been home, but her condition was terrible. Suddenly, Veronica had the idea to call John. To tell him about Victoria, maybe he could help. But she forgot that her purse, where her passport, money, and cell phone were, had been taken from her by her rapists. But she wouldn't give up. At the university, she was unlikely to be told the phone number, but her dad would be lucky. He got John's phone number through his friends and Veronica called him. When he heard the whole story, he was horrified. Why did she do it? Why didn't she tell me? He had many questions, but Veronica didn't know the answers, so interrupting him, she asked, You will come to help your sister. I'll be able to in a week at the earliest. I'll take my mom out of the hospital, and only then I'll get out. Okay. Call me when you arrive, I'll give you the address. John couldn't calm down for a long time after hearing that. Poor girl, what she'd been through. He couldn't forget what Veronica had told him. John arrived as promised a week later. He was worried sick. What would he say to her? How would he comfort her? But when he entered the room, everything became clear and simple. She recognized him immediately and even wanted to smile, but she didn't really succeed. But why was his heart beating so hard why were his palms sweating? Did he really have any feelings for her? She was also beautiful, only her current beauty was not so bright, but still, she was good. Her eyes were very sad because her heart was sad. Her soul with sad eyes was searching among the other eyes for a soul who could hear her sadness and comfort her. He did not see that Victoria, in whose eyes the devils were playing, and every minute in her head were ripening crazy ideas. When he sat down on her bed, she put her arms around his neck and sat there for so long. He felt that she was crying. Come on, why these tears? You have such beautiful eyes, and tears prevent you from seeing them. She put her palms on his face, looked at him for a long time and kissed him on the lips. 
It turned out so sincere and tender that John pressed her against him and whispered in her ear that everything would be all right and kissed her too. The kiss wasn't passionate and long, but it was precious to her. She was coming to her senses and felt loved in spite of everything. Let's go for a walk around the house. I'll take you on the swings. I have no strength, Victoria said quietly, and I'll carry you in my arms and put you on the swing. Well, well, she said, smiling for the long days she had spent in this room. The whole household sat downstairs waiting for John to come out and tell them everything. But when they saw him carrying Victoria outside in his arms, there was a silent scene. Everyone turned their heads as if on cue, seeing them off with a look. They walked for a long time until Victoria was cold. Back, she quietly walked by herself. He walked her to her room and put her in bed. She looked up at him and immediately fell asleep. John went downstairs where everyone was still waiting for him. Thank you, John. Veronica had the good sense to call you and for good reason. Her daughter's better now that you're here. While Harvey talked, John couldn't take his eyes off Veronica. How the like you two are like two peas in a pod. You have a double happiness, Harvey. He said goodbye and said he would come tomorrow. All night Victoria dreamed of a gypsy woman who reminded her of their first meeting. That she was the one who predicted it all for her. Let me tell you another fortune, the gypsy said. No, don't, I'm afraid of you scream, Victoria. Go away, don't scare me. Veronica heard her scream because their rooms were next to each other. She touched her shoulder and her sister woke up. Her forehead was wet. I'm thirsty, she said. Veronica quickly ran to get a bottle of water and gave it to her sister. Where does John in a weak voice ask Victoria? He will come later, he promised. It was July outside the window and the weather was like fall weather. It had been pouring rain since morning and it was chilly. Victoria didn't want to eat, but she was drawn to sleep. Her head fell on the pillow and sleep again took her in its soft and gentle embrace. Again, she dreamed of the gypsy woman. Your misfortunes are not yet over, you have. At this point, Victoria woke up. She was breathing heavily in her arms. Her hands were shaking as if she had Parkinson's disease. She couldn't calm down for a long time. Afraid to close her eyes and see the gypsy woman again, who would tell her what trouble still awaited her. Still, there was no John. She sat down on the bed, put her feet on the floor and walked leisurely out of the room. For the first time in a long time, she sat at the communal table and ate lunch. Why is John gone so long? She asked Veronica. Let's call them, she said, and her sister dialed his number. But the caller was unavailable. Victoria started to get nervous, crying and saying that he was disgusted with her after the rape. Meanwhile, John's car, following the highway in the direction of Victoria's house, kept to the left side and did not exceed the speed limit. The road was difficult. It was pouring rain. The driver of the truck, Gazelle, went on the side of oncoming traffic, failed to cope with the control and collided with the car, Hyundai Accent, and that in turn rammed John's car. He made a few circles on the car and drove off into the ditch. Fortunately, the car did not turn over. After hitting his head, he lost consciousness. The doctors arrived, pulled him out of the car, gave him first aid, and took him to the hospital to have a CT scan to rule out brain damage. Only in the evening, he was able to call Victoria and tell her what had happened to him. Veronica went to visit him, and Nanny volunteered to accompany her. John's head was bandaged, but he felt fine. Three days later, he was at Victoria's, but he had to get there by cab. His car was being repaired. He had to wait a little while because she had a psychologist. Victoria looked much better. A blush appeared on her cheeks. When she saw John, she smiled her white-toothed smile. There was a light in her eyes. The old Victoria was coming back. Smart beautiful, confident girl. There was still a month left before school started and John would be back in Spain, but only for a couple of weeks. She was sad and already missing him. She imagined that they would talk on the phone for a long time and he would finally tell her that he loved her very much. Despite their good relationship, John was afraid of them. The age difference intimidated him. Talking at the university, a professor's connection with a student would make so much noise. He didn't know how to do the right thing so as not to ruin the girl's life. After all, she had just turned 19. In fact, she was a child. He will still have time to think about this difficult question. But Harvey, 
as if realized that the young man has difficulties with the decision of the question and decided to help. John, do you like Victoria as a woman or are you just helping her out of her depression? Victoria is a wonderful woman, I like her very much, but do I have the right to give her hope? I'm almost twice her age. Why would she need me in 10 years? She'll only be 29 and I'll be almost 50. Do you think I can take advantage of a girl's crush? It's a complicated question. All I want is for my daughter to be happy. And with you by her side, I see her happy. Let's not rush things. I'm leaving now. And when I return, I'll solve this issue. Goodbye and goodbye to your beautiful girl. Thank you, John, and have a soft landing. John flew to Spain on the day my mom was discharged from the clinic. In the evening, the family gathered around the table. Natalie had prepared a delicious dinner. John had bought wine and appetizers, and the evening was very heartwarming and warm. Natalie kept glancing at John, but he avoided looking at her. She wanted him to propose at dinner and tell her parents, but after his meeting with Victoria, he didn't want to rush into it. Something was stopping him from making a final decision about his relationship with Natalie. By the end of the evening, she realized that there would be no marriage proposal, and her mood dropped to zero. She left quickly, saying that things couldn't wait. No one held her back or asked her to stay. John walked her to the door and gave her a peck on the cheek and said goodbye. He didn't explain anything to his parents. He had to think about everything himself. At 35, John should have gotten married a long time ago. Victoria was clearly too young for that. She needs to learn. He's sure she's mistaking a crush for great love. A young girl who dreams of the role of a wife very soon may be disappointed in this status. After all, romantic relationships and marriage are far from the same things. There will no longer be secret meetings, kisses with hindsight. There will not be that adrenaline that plays in the blood. Family life will begin, in which everyone has their own responsibilities. At the husband to earn money and provide for the family to do men's housework, and the wife to cook, wash, give birth. A man should make life easier for a woman, and he would do it for sure, but won't family life be a burden for a young girl who has not yet had her fill, hasn't had her fill? He, as a grown-up man, knows what he wants. The storm of hormones has already been experienced. So in a woman he appreciates not only appearance, attractiveness, but rather her inner world, her willingness to follow such values as family, children, home comfort. Victoria is hardly ready for all this, and one more thing worried him. Victoria was very beautiful, of course. Jealousy is peculiar to many men, but when following such a woman men wring their necks, will not give him peace. Despite the fact that he, as a man, has become both professionally and financially, and it would seem confident in himself, a sense of jealousy is not alien to him. And with Victoria, he would always live like a volcano. So thought John, lying in his room, about his future relationship with Victoria. His thoughts were interrupted by a phone call. It was Natalie. There was still no avoiding the conversation and he answered. Yes, Natalie, is something wrong? Yes, it is. I want to ask you, is there going to be no marriage proposal? Don't feel sorry for me, just tell it like it is. Don't keep me on a short leash or on reserve. You know how I feel about you and I don't deserve to be treated like I don't exist and we haven't agreed on anything. John did not interrupt her the whole time, but listened attentively. He realized she was right, but he didn't understand what was holding him back from proposing to her. Natasha, give me a couple or three more days and I'll make up my mind. No offense. Deal? Deal. And she was the first to disconnect. His mind went back to his thoughts. Natalie is 29 years old. She was a professional, financially independent, self-sufficient. A good age to get married and have children. She's a decent person, kind, sincere, loves children. And how does she cook? You can't beat it. She's not beautiful, but she's pretty. Here she is, a ready wife and future mother to your children. What's there to think about? If you marry Natalie, you will never regret your choice, said the inner voice, with which he always liked to argue. You've known her for years, a proven companion, and importantly, your parents like her. Yeah, that's true. His mom, Veronica, told him to marry Natalie, that's all. And you like her yourself, because you're the one who should be in bed with her. Not your mom, the inner voice told me. Before I met Victoria, 
I thought I loved her. Well, then it's decided. Call and propose. The inner voice commanded. I will. Natalie's my man, but Victoria. Victoria will meet her prince. He will be younger, prettier. And of course he will love her very much, because it is impossible not to love such a beautiful woman. The next day he called Natalie and invited her to visit. Taking her hand, he went up to his parents and said, Mom, Dad, I'm getting married. This is my future wife. Do you bless me for union with her? And his parents said with one voice, yes. They decided to get married on New Year's Eve. Every year on the 31st, they would celebrate their family day. Natalie was happy because she had never loved anyone in her life as much as she loved John. Her dream had come true, and she would soon be Natalie Sounds. She loved everything about John. John quit the university because he realized that Victoria had no breaks. She would wait for him, worry about him. He would just feel sorry for this girl, who had already been through too much lately. Just before the school year, he called her, congratulated her, wished her success and excellent marks. She spoke to him quite cheerfully, so she was in a good mood. After that, he threw away the old Sahayam card and inserted a new one. He noted to himself that he did it all with regret, but there was no turning back. Family life was ahead, and it was necessary to prepare for it morally. They applied to the registry office and began to prepare for the wedding. He moved to live with Natalie. She had her own apartment, and he had a rented one. They were not going to have a big wedding. They would rather spend the money at a ski resort in fabulous Switzerland. Both were scouting well, so there were no disputes about where to go. At the Swiss resort, the young wanted to celebrate the new year once again. Preparation for the wedding, for the new year, invitations to guests, all this made our newlyweds twirl and turn, but there was really a lot to do. John helped Natalie in everything. Friends also did not sit idly by. September 1st, third year, how quickly time flies. Just out of high school with Veronica and already in her third year of college. The first thing she did was to look at the schedule of the second year to see when she could see John. His class was scheduled three times a week. Like us, nothing in the schedule had changed. I'll go over and say hello tomorrow. I miss him, Victoria thought languidly, closing her eyes. She didn't even notice that opposite the name of the subject, there was a completely different name of the teacher. She was so engrossed in the upcoming meeting that she bumped forehead with Shanka. Listen, how mature you've become. What a handsome man. Look, Billy, you should go into modeling. You look really good. Do you really like me? Maybe we could go out and celebrate the start of school. No, no, Janeshka, I don't mean like you. You're handsome, no argument, but you're not mine. As a friend, I'm not gonna give you to anybody, okay? Billy said with a faded look in his eyes. While they were talking to Zhenka, dozens of guys' eyes opened wider at the sight of Victoria, especially the freshman. Pretty girl, what year are you in? The boulder once asked. Go, go, you are still small, answered them the girl. The next day, she chose her outfit more carefully. Makeup was minimal. She knew that John liked it better. As she approached the auditorium where he was to have his lecture, she waited stubbornly for him. Students came in, many she knew and said hello. But here a man showed up, but it wasn't John. He came to the door and asked Victoria, Will you be coming in? No, I'm looking for John. And who is he? I don't know him, I'm sorry. She rushed to the dean's office. Betty, honey, where's John? Well, he quit back in the summer. He quit. Do you know where he went? No, nobody knows for sure, but they say he's done teaching. He's working as a consultant for some firm. I don't know which one. She didn't know what to compare her condition to. She'd been run over by a skating rink. She's dead. She's gone. Is he disgusted with me after what happened? Well, he realizes it could happen to anyone. Not just anyone. It could happen to you. Because you're reckless, the inner voice couldn't resist intervening. You shut up. No one's asking you. Victoria sharply parried him without you. She didn't want to study anymore today. She went to Veronica's faculty, took her out of class, and they went for a walk, eating ice cream and talking. Yes, talking, because that's what she needed most of all. How could he, Veronica, say nothing and just disappear from my life? Your sister told you to call him. She dialed his number, but there was no answer, but there was no answer. 
He changed his SIM card. Listen, I know where he lives. Let's go, eh? Well, let's go, Veronica said reluctantly. She didn't like this situation. It was high time for her sister to calm down and move on. It was not her man. Other people lived in the apartment where the previous tenant had gone. They had no idea. Her last hope of finding John was gone. She hadn't gone to the university for the third day, lying with her arms stretched out along her torso. Veronica sat next to her, talking to her the whole time. Veronica, well, if he didn't want to commit his personal life to me, we could have stayed friends, couldn't we? What do you think? I think it's a bad idea. Why do you think that? Because you're not ready for it, and that's just how you keep him in your life with the hope of getting him back. I mean, think about it. Could you handle that kind of friendship? Surely you'd want more, wouldn't you? Victoria was silent for a long time and answered, Yes, I get him with this friendship, and we probably become enemies. That's what I'm saying. Veronica, maybe I should find a replacement for him. Why, I have a huge choice at uni. No, dear sister, you shouldn't. Take a break. Realize the experience. Analyze your former relationships so you don't make mistakes later. Don't get yourself worked up. Do not build yourself a jilted bride, by the way, which you never were. Minimize the tragedy of the situation. Nothing fatal happened. Listen, Veronica, maybe I should go to a fortune teller. Vic, you're losing your mind. You don't need a fortune teller. John didn't promise you anything. He said you're not a couple. Isn't that right? That's right. That's it. Go back to sleep and go to school tomorrow. Okay. Yes, tomorrow for school. Thank you, sis. You're welcome. They kissed and left to meet again tomorrow. Five years had passed since the above events. During that time, the girls graduated from university and worked for Harvey at the firm. Veronica was a senior lawyer in the department and Victoria was in charge of the economic department and very successfully. She was a strict boss, sometimes even harsh, but everyone loved her because Victoria was fair. She always helped her employees and noticed good work. Veronica was getting ready to get married. Nanny proposed to her and she gave her consent. Victoria, on the other hand, had never been able to give her heart to anyone. She still hadn't forgotten John, even though she hadn't seen him since, and he hadn't made himself known. She looked for him on social networks, but did not find him even turned to the ace of computer thought, but they said that he is not registered there. And John lived and worked not that far from Victoria. He married Natalie and they had a son, Harry, and a daughter, Victoria. One day, while sorting through the piles of magazines that were already falling out of her nightstand, Victoria saw a three-year-old family magazine that she bought on occasion on the front cover. She saw John with his wife and children. Inside on the spread was a huge article about the Queen family. The Art of Being a Family was the title of the article. Why hadn't she seen this magazine before? How could it have passed her by? Victoria read it several times in a row. A welcoming atmosphere reigns in John and Natalie's family. Their friendly family consists of four people, mom, dad, darling daughter, Victoria, and son, Harry. As the head of the family, John told us, with his wife, he was familiar with the Institute. He could not resist such a beauty. The wedding was played. Every time she finished reading to this point, she threw the magazine and began to remember again and again their meetings with John. John's son is two years old and his daughter is a year old, so now the children are five and four years old. Why did he name his daughter Victoria? Isn't there any other name? So he wanted to leave a memory of her, or maybe love. She asked her father to get John's address from the magazine editor. She just wanted to meet him and talk to him. Dad sent a public relations woman to the magazine very knowledgeable, very talkative, explained the situation to her in general terms. Okay, Harvey, I'll try to help you. A week went by and my father had some very interesting information. He didn't know how to tell his daughter. Knowing her impulsive character, he kept postponing the conversation on this topic. But Victoria felt that her father knew something, but she did not tell her. So one day she went to his office and told him she wouldn't leave until he told her. He started by saying that John was a widower. What? What did you say? He's raising the kids alone? Victoria, sit down and calm down. That's why I didn't want to tell you as long as possible about this. Enough, Dad. I'm already on edge. Her father, knowing his crazy daughter who paced the office from corner to corner, 
asked her to sit down and not to rush him. Taking a deep breath, he began to tell what he had learned about. Three years ago, his wife Natalie was the editor of this magazine. She was described as a good person and a knowledgeable professional. Three years ago, along with other staff members, she was in an area contaminated by radiation. Natalie decided to interview those who were left to live with their families in those areas. There was a terrible mortality rate there, especially child deaths, but people had nowhere to go and stayed in their homes. There was a huge article about these families, children in her magazine. The authorities before that article didn't want to recognize the problem, but Natalie stirred up the anthill and these families started to get help. But after a year, she started to feel sick herself. At first, she wrote it all off as fatigue, but when it became unbearable, she went to the doctor. She was diagnosed with cancer, already at the second stage. She underwent surgery and a year later she relapsed. After more surgeries and chemotherapy, she died last year. John was left with two children. Since his parents are in Spain, Natalie's mom came to stay with him. She now lives in his house and helps with the children. He works hard. You have to support the house and the two children. It's all very difficult. That's about it, I guess. Did she get an address or a phone number? She did, but I don't think you should call him, let alone go to his house. The kid's grandmother might not like it. It hasn't been that long yet. Wait, don't rush him. Dad, I want to offer to help. Victoria, you know you can't do anything to help. Distracting him from the kids, making him nervous, yes, but he doesn't need that yet. Everything is still fresh in his mind. Victoria knew her father was right, but she was afraid of losing him again. A man like that would never be ignored by a woman, but she decided to wait. A couple of times she drove to this house and saw him from afar. She saw the children greeting him, Natalie's mother walking with them. But she had the good sense not to get out of the car, but to watch from the sidelines. Six months later, without saying anything to her father, she drove up to this house. And when she saw him get out of the car, she went out to meet him. Well, hello, John. How long I've waited for this meeting. But if you tell me to leave now, I won't be here again. Hello, Victoria. No, I won't. I'm very happy to see you. Come on, I'll introduce you to my children. Is this convenient? Am I disturbing anyone? No one is fine. Seeing the beautiful woman, Natalie's mother retreated to her room with her lips pressed together. And the children surrounded their father. It was obvious that they were happy to see him. Kids, I'd like you to meet my friend Victoria. Harry was the first to be introduced. Beautiful, just like a princess. I'm Harry, my dad and grandma call me Harry. What can I call you? What do you like? Harry sounds soft and affectionate. I think I'll call you that too. It's a deal, said the boy. And little Victoria hid behind her daddy and didn't want to go near a strange aunt, even though she was beautiful. But Victoria gave her a doll and the child gave in. All the rest of the evening, she sat in the arms of a strange aunt. Then everyone drank tea, but John's mother-in-law never came out though the children called for her. The children had to go to bed and Victoria went home. Will you be coming back to see us again? Harry asked. If your daddy lets me, I'd love to come. Daddy will let us, said John. He walked Victoria to the car and they said goodbye. As soon as John entered the house, his mother-in-law flew up to him and started in on him. That you've already forgotten your wife, got yourself a woman and even brought her home. You forgot my daughter quickly. It's not even been two years since you went out with women. Sophia, don't say things you don't know. Victoria is an old acquaintance of mine. Former student. I've never forgotten Natalie, and I never will. So why did she come to our house? Swear to me you're not having an affair with her, my mother-in-law asked in a raised tone. Well, first of all, I'm not going to swear anything to you. She came to my house. And secondly, my friends can come to me or I have to ask your permission. Who can come to me and who cannot? I am an adult and I will decide who I want to socialize with and when. I am very grateful for your help, but if it is in exchange for control over my private life, then I'd rather put my children in a daycare center. Sophia was afraid that her son-in-law could deprive her of communication with her grandchildren and lowered the degree of claims. You do not take offense at me, it just hurt for my daughter. She just died and you've already found another one. I've said it all, Sophia, and I won't go back to this conversation. I told you before, I'll tell you now, 
If there's a woman my children will love, she'll be my wife. Of course, I won't be single all my life, however much you may wish it. That said, I don't forget Natalie for a minute and am very grateful to her for the years we've been together. The week passed quietly. Victoria didn't come or call. On Sunday close to noon, she arrived and invited me to take the kids for a walk. There's nothing for them to do outside. It's cold there. They can catch cold, said the mother-in-law, as always loudly and with an irritated intonation. Hello, and we'll go to the shopping center. It's warm, lots of entertainment. I think the children will like it, said Victoria in a calm tone. Who are you? She thought Sophia teased her. Your opinion is nobody here. But John came up and the mother-in-law faltered. John told the kids to get dressed. We're going out. Yay, the kids screamed. Sure, Grandma loved them, but they've been at home all week, walking around outside the house. They, understandably, wanted entertainment. While riding in the car, Victoria talked to Harry. He knew a lot of fairy tales, reasoning about good and evil. But he didn't know letters, he couldn't read, and he was already six years old. Victoria was still a little girl, but it was time for her to study a little too. John, you have to put kids in daycare. They don't socialize with their peers. They don't do anything but read fairy tales. That's good, but it's not enough. Children need to develop. John said nothing, but realized that Victoria was right. When they arrived, they went to the children's entertainment center. The kids there were playing and Harry came over too. He watched at first and then he wanted to play too. He started pushing the kids to get into the center. The kids didn't like that and they started pushing him too. John wanted to intervene, but Victoria stopped him. This is what I told you about. He doesn't know how to play in a group because he doesn't socialize with his peers. Don't rush him. Let him try to solve the problem himself. But the child took offense and ran to complain to his dad. John, as best he could, explained to him that he was wrong. We arrived home only in the evening. The children were happy, although they were tired. Saying goodbye, Victoria told him to think about her words. John found a private kindergarten and put the children there, but it cost him part of his life and health. At home there was a huge scandal. The mother-in-law did not try to restrain herself and did not hesitate to express herself. You this girl hummed in your ear that the children should be given to a kindergarten, right? I can see right through that bitch. She wants to get into bed with you. So she's all about the kids and you. But I ain't gonna let that happen. Next time, she'll be out of this house like a cork out of a bottle. That could be your mistress. Why'd you name your daughter Victoria so you wouldn't forget about her? Isn't that a steep price to pay, Sophia? You're a smart woman and of course you want the best for your grandchildren. Do you think they need to socialize with their peers? Do they need to know something else besides the fairy tales you read to them? Do they need to be ready for school? Why don't you tell me I'm wrong? That's just it. And about the name Victoria, Natalie named her that and you know it. The mother-in-law didn't say anything and left, slamming the door. The children liked the kindergarten very much. Only the teacher complained that Harry hurt the children if they didn't give him a toy. The kids complained to their parents and they complained to me. I explained to him how to behave, but he was very offended and all day long. You see, he sits in the corner. You can talk to him at home. John didn't think Victoria would be so right. For six months, he struggled with Harry and the problem of how to behave with the boys. Then the teacher would tell John. We won. He started to communicate with the kids and they accepted him. I'm so happy for the kid. He did it. John was proud of his son too. But he was even more grateful to Victoria. Veronica and Nanny's wedding day was approaching. John received the invitation as well. They entered the wedding hall with Victoria. She was over the moon. The wedding was grand. There were not many people, the closest people and friends, but it was a lot of fun. Songs, dances, toasts. John made a very beautiful toast. Weddings are special celebrations, beautiful, unforgettable. Many people say that after the wedding from the relationship leaves all the romance and remain only gray everyday life. I would like to tell you that everything depends only on you. Remember this always, because how you will build a family life, such it will turn out as a result. Happiness to you, and let the flame that burns between you nowhere never disappear. Bitter. She'd never dance with him.
And now he asked her to dance and in her ear told her thank you for having her in his life again. His arm was around her waist and he held her tightly in his embrace. She was only afraid of one thing, that the music would end quickly and he would rush home to the kids. But she reassured herself that he wouldn't be lost for so long now, especially since he didn't want to be. She had much to ask him, to find out how he had lived all this time. But she had matured, become more mature, and waited for her time. She knew it would come soon. The house became more crowded. Nanny came to live with his wife. Even though he had a nice apartment, they were together 24 hours a day. At work, Veronica was his subordinate, and at home, Nanny obeyed Veronica in everything. But her sister wondered how they never bored each other. Perhaps it was love. Veronica was a wise and patient woman. She smoothed out all the sharp corners with one word and always said that Nanny was the main person in the family. This gave the spouse confidence in himself, and he thanked Veronica for it. As soon as Harry had everything settled in kindergarten, Victoria offered to take a teacher to prepare for school. I have an employee in my department, Oleshka. Her mother is an elementary school teacher, but retired. She could come to Harry's house once a week, say on Saturday, and tutor him. Victoria would have to study too, but since she's younger, they have different curriculums, I guess. But I think Victoria would hear and see everything, and it would be good for her too. I know it's hard for you to provide for two children alone, and services have never been cheap. But I can help you by giving you a bonus on top of Katie's paycheck to pay for Harry's tuition for her mom. Victoria, thank you, but it's unnecessary. I make good money, and I can pay my son's tuition. Don't humiliate me. I'm a man, and I've always felt responsible for my family and my children. No offense, John but I mean well. Then I'll make the arrangements and we'll start school on Saturday. Thank you, Victoria. You've been a great help. On Saturday as arranged, Mallory came to Harry's house. He liked her immediately. As Victoria had expected, her daughter stood like a tin soldier and absorbed what Harry's teacher was saying. It was only Sophia who wasn't happy. The children were pissed off with their classes, teaching and teaching, as if they wouldn't have time to learn everything in school. But when in a month both children knew all the letters and Harry was already reading syllables, she cried, kissing him on the top of his head and saying, What a good boy you are. You're just like your mommy. She'd be proud of you. Six months passed. Harry read wonderfully, counted to 20 and solved simple examples. The child learned to retell what he had read, which developed his speech and increased his vocabulary. The question of choosing a school came up. There was a school in the cottage village but John wanted a more prestigious one. Victoria advised him to give him to this school, which is not far from his home. If your mother-in-law gets sick, if you are on a business trip, the child will be able to get to school on his own. It's quiet here. There's security, no strangers' cars. But already in high school, you can transfer to a prestigious school. Mallory will also come, at first, to help the child to do his homework. And in four years, we'll see. John agreed with Victoria's arguments, and Harry went to a school near the house. Everyone came to see him off to first grade. His grandmother, little sister, father, and Aunt Victoria. The child was very happy, felt supported, and was not afraid of anything. Little Victoria was raring to go to her brother. She wanted to stand next to him and hold his hand. Finally, John let her go, and she walked over to Harry and stood next to him. She didn't want to go home so she went to class with him. Then they were brought home together. The first day there were no lessons, but there was a holiday called Knowledge Day. At first Sophia saw him off and met him from school, and after two months he was already walking by himself with other children. So the adults got it right. Mallory came to Harry, did lessons with him, and was very pleased with her student. John saw that it was hard for her to come to her son every day, and he offered her to live in the house, and on Saturday he would take her home. She agreed, because she already wanted to refuse from classes. Age was making itself felt. Sophia at first sulked, even did not talk, but seeing the peaceful and calm character of Mallory began to soften. They talked a lot about life, went for walks, drank tea, and mother-in-law was glad of such a neighborhood. Victoria and John were very timidly establishing a relationship. She was sure that a relationship with a man would bring her what she needed, love, tenderness, attention, everything that a woman gets when she is loved. She was not in a hurry and active. 
After all, sometimes a woman herself begins to rush events or worse, to lead the process, which is very frightening and repulses a man. Being a grown-up lady, she did not rush events, did not push the man, and gave him the opportunity to sort out his feelings. She did not call him first, did not impose meetings. She waited for activity on his part and was afraid to scare away the fragile happiness that smiled on her after five years. She realized that after a few meetings, she shouldn't treat it like she was marrying him tomorrow. She was very afraid of hurting his feelings for his ex-wife. That was another reason they kept her in no hurry. She didn't want to take up all of his free time and space with her. She also realized that a mature man does not show his feelings immediately, and John was far from being a boy. Despite her mother-in-law's displeasure, they met, went to the theater, movies, gave time to their children, who missed their father very much, but were in no hurry to go to bed, although both of them wanted it very much. Harry finished first grade. He studied easily. Mallory praised him very much. John thanked her for her work, for her warm attitude to Harry, gave her a salary, a bonus, and let her go on vacation. It was almost a year and a half after their meeting, but nothing had moved forward. John did not make any steps to get closer, and Victoria lost hope for personal happiness. She decided to go on vacation to a warm place, to bask in the sun, to think and maybe start a new life, a whole new life without John. She took the tickets and flew away. The sea, the sun, the white sand was beautiful. What a nice vacation. She remembered only now that she hadn't been on vacation for two years. Work, her new position, it took up all her time. She slept as peacefully as a baby. It had been ten days since she'd been in this magical place, but it was as if she hadn't rested yet. One day she dreamed again of a gypsy woman from that distant time. This time she was friendlier. Well, why are you afraid of me? I remember you screaming and crying so I wouldn't scare you. Everything I predicted for you came true. Now I can tell you what's next for you. Do you want some? No, don't. Let everything stay the way it is. What's to come is what's to come. You once told me I wasn't cut out for married life, but I think you were wrong about that. I want to get married. I want kids, but I can't. Well, there are single people. Don't worry, you won't get married for a long time, but everything will end well. And most importantly, you're in for a big surprise. You have no idea, but it's gonna bring you joy. And she was gone. Victoria opened her eyes hard, her head ached a little. She decided that she would not go to the beach today. She took a shower, ate breakfast and felt better. No, I'll go to the beach and lie down at least in the shade. Get some sea air. She dozed off again and woke up to someone staring at her. When she opened her eyes, she saw John looking at her and smiling. Well, you wanted to run away and I found you here. Why did you disappear so suddenly? I thought I would never see you again. I thought, well, I can't wait for John to be nice to me. I got to do something about it and start living without him. Get used to everyone going their own way. No, Victoria, we'll go together if that's okay with you. No, I don't mind because I love you. Harry graduated from elementary school with a commendation. It was a great credit to Mallory who taught him so much. The daughter finished third grade. John and Victoria decided to give the children a party. They invited friends and girlfriends from school, invited clowns, set the tables right outside. The children had fun, and in the evening there was fireworks, a very beautiful sight. It was getting dark. Parents came for the children and barely took them all home. The holiday turned out to be a glory. Even Sophia liked it. Victoria wanted to go home. But John offered her to stay and go only in the morning. But Sophia had her own five cents here too. Late for children and for adults, it's not too late to go home, especially by car in no way. She did not want another woman to be next to John. Victoria didn't argue, packed up and left. As she passed her mother-in-law, John heard her. Thank God she's gone or she'd be here all night. As long as I'm alive, no woman will come here. John realized he had to consummate his relationship with Victoria. The kids adored her, and she was great to them too, so she was no mom to the kids. With these thoughts in mind, he drove to her place. On the way he bought flowers, stopped at a jewelry store, and bought a ring. The closer he got to her house, the more his heart pounded. It had been almost six years since Natalie had passed, 
he hadn't had a relationship with anyone but Victoria. He would liked her then, liked her now. But did he love her? He knew he did. The fear of losing her spoke to his true feelings for this woman. He has a desire to protect, pity her, care for and defend her. It speaks of love and tender feelings for her. He sincerely admired his Victoria and except for her, he did not need anyone. She was a sensual woman is a real gift for a man. She was always emotional and lived with an open heart. She wanted love from him, tenderness, and she liked to express her feelings in a physical way, kissing, hugging. It was nice to feel how she reacted to his touch. She was always trembling and that made him delighted. Yes, she was a gorgeous woman. That's what John thought as he drove up to her house. Seeing John with a bouquet of flowers from the window, Victoria nervously paced the room anticipating soon changes in his personal life. And she was not mistaken, right from the door, handing her a bouquet of flowers, he gave her a ring and called her to marry. She hung on him with joy and, covering his face with kisses, repeated, yes, 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 yes. She did not let him take off his cloak, she embraced him and did not want to let him go. Why did the tears flow so much? Why did my eyes sting so much? The mascara. It smeared on her face and made her look ugly. Don't look at me. I'm ugly now. You never were, but now you're the prettiest and happiest, my girl. And finally, he allowed himself to relax and kiss her. How long she had waited for this. I am the happiest woman in the world. You understand me the happiest. Of course I understand, because I'm just as happy. Come on, let's go tell Daddy. Harvey was working in his office and was happy to see John. Papa, Papa, John has proposed to me, and I've accepted. I'm about to be the wife of the best man in the world. Will you bless us? How can I not when my daughter is the happiest I've ever seen? That's the most important thing to a father. Veronica and Nanny came and congratulated the newlyweds. Veronica moved quietly. It was hard for her. She was about to give birth to twins, men. Nanny was happy to be the father of two sons. John, please move him into our house. I found him a good English school. I think it would be cruel to deprive her so abruptly of her grandchildren. Friday night, we'll all go over to her place. It's a long winter vacation. We'll be together too. As soon as she finishes fourth grade, we'll put her in Harry's school. I think we should do that. I'll think about it, John said, how to do it without offending anyone. I'll go. I've got to talk to my mother-in-law. I don't think she'll be as happy as your dad. They kissed and he left. Sophia, I decided to get married. I just proposed to a woman you know very well. It's been six years since Natalie left us. My children need a mother, and I need a woman to love. Victoria is the best person for that role. The children adore her and she treats them well so I see no reason to delay the marriage. We haven't set a date yet, but I think it'll be soon. I always knew you were a bastard. I don't know if Natalie told you, but I was against her marrying you. There's no place to test you. She was deliberately insulting him, using the most hurtful language to make him mad and then accusing him of being unbalanced and not trustworthy with children. John sat with his fist clenched so tightly that his hands were white. I'm sure. My mother-in-law continued that you've had this girl before, and you cheated on my daughter with her. It's just that Natalie loved you so much she didn't want to see it. And I told her to keep an eye on you, but she wouldn't let me, which is a shame. I would have brought you out in the open. You're such a cheapskate. Sophia, what you want me to do? Tell me if I can do it, but I won't listen to any more of this nonsense. You don't have to get married. No other woman can come into this house where the mother of your children lived. Thousands of men live widowed and don't marry, they don't die, and here it's only been six years and he's already thinking of getting married. Good people, look at this womanizer. Where does it seem that someone else imputed grandmother, my grandchildren called mom? I won't let that happen. So, as I understand it, you don't want me to get married? No, I don't, and you have no right to ignore my opinion. All right, dear mother-in-law. I've put up with all your insults and insults for the sake of Natalie's memory and the children you love. But I see that your rudeness has gone beyond all bounds. Whatever you do, I'm getting married. If you insult me like you did today, you can pack a suitcase and go back to your village. I won't stand for this rudeness any longer. If you turn your children against me, 
there will be no place for you in this house. Think about it, you've got all night. If you don't agree with me, you'll pack your bags and go home in the morning. If you stay, I'll know you've accepted the inevitable. Oh, I forgot to tell you something else. Harry will live at Victoria's house from September 1st and attend English school there. You, if you agree, of course, will stay here with your granddaughter for another year. And after a year, I will take her away and she will also go to school with Harry. You could stay in the house. It's more comfortable than yours. But you know the conditions. Now I've said everything. Think about it. I won't change my mind. What kind of father are you? You're a snake, not a father. Natalie sees everything from above. She and I will not let you live. All right, Sophia, I'll take you right now while I have time. I'm waiting for you. Don't wait for me. You gave me till morning, so I'll decide what to do in the morning. Or are you going to keep the old woman out? Or better yet, beat her up? Sophia, I admire your imagination. Where do you get all this stuff? Have I ever hurt you, humiliated you, or worse, beat you? Where does this coming from? It's like I'm having a bad dream and I can't wake up. Stop fantasizing and go get some rest. The morning is the wiser. And he went to say good night to the children, who wouldn't fall asleep until he performed this ritual. In the morning, the mother-in-law did not come out for breakfast, and the children ran to her room to see their grandmother. She was lying there with high blood pressure, and John called an ambulance. They gave her a shot and told her to lie down for a day. John called work and took the day off to be with the kids. He didn't want to leave the house, not to leave Sophia Nikolaevna alone, so he didn't go anywhere with the kids and they played in the yard. For a whole week, the mother-in-law did not speak to them. She did not know how to act. Her anger at John for her daughter was running out of steam, and she was afraid to snap, lest she be rude to him again and give him a stroke. She decided to call Mallory. Having told her everything in detail, she was sure that she would be on her side. But her friend listened to her for a long time, kept silent and finally decided to give her opinion. It's sad, dear Sophia. What you are doing is not a good example for your grandchildren. Your jealousy blinds you. I must give credit to your son-in-law for his tact and patience with you. In someone else's monastery, with their own statutes wise people do not climb. You're only making things worse by your behavior. It's been six years since John left his wife, but life goes on. I realize losing the daughter is not just a grief, it's a tragedy, especially since you had her alone. But your son-in-law is a young man. He needs to raise children. The girl needs a mom. Soon she will have questions that can only be answered by a woman. She will not all be able to tell dad and Victoria she loves. My daughter, on the other hand, if left alone, would never marry. She'd be faithful to that scoundrel. So why does he have to get married? Sophia, you can't even control yourself when you talk to me right now and you're calling John names. That's not the dignity of a grown woman. And about your Natalie's marriage, I'll tell you this. It's harder for a woman with two children to get married. It's not just her desire. There must be a man who loves her and her children. And then a woman has a very short reproductive age and men want their children. That's why your son-in-law is marrying the woman half his age. If you love your grandchildren and want to continue to communicate with them, if you value the memory of your daughter, do not persecute the man she loved so much. Your son-in-law is a decent man, an excellent and caring father. For six years, he's kept your daughter's memory alive. He has a right to be happy. Don't interfere with him. I would advise you to be kinder to him more compliant and you will spend your whole life near your beloved grandchildren. Patience and wisdom. That's not what I expected from you. I thought you support me. What am I supposed to do? Bless him or something? Well, at least stay out of his way. Okay, Mallory. Thanks for the lesson. I got it. And she went to her room to prepare for her final battle with her son-in-law. She decided to take the children to her village and before leaving to call the guardianship authorities, let them come. Ask the grief-stricken father, where are your children? Let him answer if he can. Of course, she realized that the children will not take away from him, but the nerves of him. She will fray his nerves before the wedding. My poor daughter, if you knew what's going on in our kingdom, she cried looking at her daughter's picture. She called the guardianship authorities, told them about the children, where half of the information was taken from TV shows, asked when they could come and look at all this. 
The lady with the squeaky voice says she'd get a call back. The next day, she got an early call back, before John had even left for work. She was afraid he would figure it out, so she went up to her room to talk. Hello, Sophia, squeaked the same familiar voice. Maddie will be able to come over tomorrow afternoon. Have a good day. She heard the beeps and disconnected the phone. To be honest, she regretted her action. She was scared, but it was done, and she couldn't go any further. The next day, as soon as John left for work, she did not clean anything from the table, but on the contrary scattered the children's things and left with the children to this village. The inspection came when no one was home, and after waiting for a while they saw a car drive up to the house and an imposing man get out of it. The women looked at each other and as if on command, began to tidy themselves up. One fixed her hair, another raised her bust higher, and the third looked in the mirror and painted her lips. Lining up, they waited for the man to come closer. John. Good afternoon, we're from Child Welfare. May I speak to your children and see their living conditions? He immediately realized that this was his mother-in-law's last effort before he got married. She didn't understand anything. All right, come on, I'll show you around. The youngest Leslie gave a thumbs up, looking at her friend. Oh my God, what a man. As he opened the door and let the women through, he was surprised that no one was home. Where are your children? The most experienced one asked sternly. She was older than the others in age and apparently in position. John realized that if he said I don't know, they would immediately give him a verdict. Bad father who doesn't look after his children. To gather his thoughts, he motioned for everyone to sit down and said, He and Sophia are walking. She is a grandmother, the mother of his ex-wife. And where they are walking, you can call them, invite them home, we want to talk to them. While you're calling them, show them your kids' rooms. So they followed John up to the second floor of the house. The children's rooms were always such a mess in three layers of dust, and she ran her finger along the shelves where the children's books and toys were. No, of course, apparently Grandma was in a hurry to go out with her grandchildren and hadn't tidied up the rooms. In an understandably caustic and drawling voice, Maddie said, so we'll wait for your kids today. No, my mother-in-law's cell phone is not available. Too bad, too bad. I'm gonna have to terminate a father's parental rights. What was that for? Dust on the shelves? Don't you ever see that in your house? Don't be rude, my dear. It could cost you. Are you threatening me? No, of course not. But I'm telling you how it could end. Tomorrow, early in the morning, we'll come again. And they walked out of the gate in a single file. John called Cindy and asked her to come over today and clean the house. He said to bring a helper with him so it would be clean today. Waiting for them, he drove to the settlement to pick up the kids. He was sure that's where his mother-in-law had taken the kids. An hour later he was there. The children were already going to sleep. Quickly they gathered their things and into the car the father commanded. The children were happy to see him and quickly ran to the car. Sophia stood on the hood and looked at her son-in-law with bulging eyes. You I don't want to see in my house anymore. You don't belong there. Natalie must be turning over in her grave from your antics. But it won't change anything. The wedding's in August. As they drove off, through the rear window he saw Sophia running after the car, waving her fists. She arrived at his house again in the middle of the night. When he opened the door for her, she walked with her head down and went up to her room. At precisely 9 o'clock in the morning, the women's team came to John's house in the same formation. The children were already eating breakfast when the guests entered the house. After talking to the kids, they went up to their rooms again. After looking at the perfect order, they went downstairs. Well, John, we liked everything. You seem to be a good father, or rather, trying to be one. It is commendable. We'll come back and see how the children are growing up. Goodbye. Good luck to you. Leslie looked at John with eyes that said more than words could say. But John paid no attention to her, and they left. John decided not to start the conversation with his mother-in-law first. Sophia, after a phone call with her friend and a check from the guardianship authorities, started it herself. John, I've given a lot of thought to the rest of our lives, and you're free to do as you see fit. I've realized what I've been saying is resentment for my daughter, jealousy. I even confess to you that I called the child welfare authorities to take the children away from you. Then I thought about my daughter. 
she wouldn't forgive me. She loved you too much, but it was too late to cancel their visit. I thought long and hard about whether to tell you, but I figured if I didn't, it would be a sin on my soul. I was gonna give you a heart attack, but I was gonna call an ambulance later. My hands were shaking when I poured that medicine in your tea, but I couldn't. The kids ran up to you and hugged you. I thought if God took their mother from them, what am I going to do with them as orphans? I can't lift them up and make them happy. I poured out the tea. I'm sorry, John. I'm sorry I overreacted. I'll tell you right off, I hate your Victoria and I never will. She took my daughter's place undeservedly, but I'll put up with her for my grandchildren. I'd rather you were a widower, but I realize you're a young man and you need a family. Today, we close this topic and bury the hatchet. For the sake of my grandchildren, I'm ready to step on the throat of my own song. Thank you, Sophia, for your candor. I want to tell you that the wedding is scheduled for the end of August because then we will go to my parents with the children. They haven't seen them for a long time and missed them. Mother-in-law cried and with the words, do as you please, went to her room. The wedding day came. The most unforgettable day in the life of newlyweds. Such a holiday happens once in a lifetime and the happiness it brings lasts a lifetime. For Victoria, the white dress, flowers, ransom, all these wedding attributes did not matter. It was important for her to hear from John, yes, when he answered the question, do you, John, want to take Victoria Andreevna as your wife? After all, it would be said in front of all the guests and witnesses, and this, nothing less than a declaration of love, and it is the most favorite tune for her hearing. For them, this was a momentous day. This is their first and main love ball, which will be remembered forever and will usher in a new married life for them. John kept his eyes on her. You're embarrassing me. You have no idea how proud I get when other men turn around and stare at you. My vocabulary is so poor that I can't tell you how amazed I am by your beauty. Standing at the check-in, Victoria heard, God, such a beauty. Such an old chose on the voice, she did not recognize who it was and did not turn around. But she heard the answer and recognized the voice of her beloved sister. He is the love of her life and she doesn't need anything else. Victoria noted to herself, well done, Veronica. She said everything right and she pressed closer to John. The mother-in-law didn't come to the wedding. No one asked her to come. She would only spoil everyone's mood though everyone sympathized with her grief. The children were a few days late for school and stayed with their grandparents. After the wedding, Sophia calmed down a bit and treated Victoria as a member of the family. Both young families lived in the house as Harvey wanted. He built this huge house for this purpose. Victoria and John had a baby girl. They named her Natalie. After that, Sophia thawed out and was happy to take care of the child, although the fact she was a complete stranger to her. Vykochka and Harry went to an English school. John's daughter called Victoria mom, but Harry managed to do it once in a while. Mom, I'm already late for school. And then Aunt Victoria. But she didn't take offense. Harry remembered his mom and maybe it was hard for him to call anyone else that warm word. Harvey had retired and the two sons-in-law ran the firm. The house breathed happiness because it was filled with children and love. Why don't you want to come with me? My daughter will have more opportunities there. It's Europe, not your backwater. A phone call interrupted that heated conversation. Come and see, it's a three room, I'm waiting. What are you thinking? I'm not going to sell the apartment. I've got a job here, my daughter's got school. What are you doing all of a sudden? I'm entitled to this apartment too. If you don't want to sell, I'll sell my share, but you have priority to buy my share. Hurry up or you'll be living with strangers. I've been paying for your share for 11 years, it's been mine for a long time. You shouldn't have. I didn't ask you to do that. I consulted a lawyer. You have no right to anything here. Take your stuff and go back where you came from. Well, you're going to regret this. Lost the battle, but not the war, Emma said angrily and slammed the door shut. After the movie Harvey, hugging his green-eyed beauty, Emma said, We study with you in different institutes, but I hope to live together. Are you proposing to me? Well, almost. I haven't bought you a ring yet, but as soon as I look for one, I'll go to my parents to ask for your hand in marriage. When they said goodbye at home, they could not part. Each kiss was the last, and everything began again. 
until her mother called her daughter home from the balcony with a menacing voice. Immediately bouncing away from each other, Emma scurried into the entryway. They were both students. She at the Faculty of Foreign Languages, he at Polytechnic and Software Engineering. They'd met on the bus when they'd been riding on the footboard during rush hour. Harvey was a very independent guy. His mother raised him alone, so there was no hope that someone would help him. They lived more than modestly, but always in their small one-room apartment, it was clean, smelled cozy pies. Mom, Lucy, was a simple woman, strict during her work at the factory in the trade union committee. She developed a commanding voice and a keen sense of justice. She had to appear in court to defend the rights of women workers, and there were many things. She loved her son very much. He was born of a beloved man who left her early, but Harvey knew only good things about his father, though he did not remember him well. Emma was a self-confident girl, a little narcissistic. She knew perfectly well what men liked, but she gave Harvey no reason to be jealous of her. She treasured their friendship. Harvey was like her father, Harry. Hands grew from the right place, thoughtful, scratched the back of his head before deciding on something, walked around, thought, and only then made a decision. Emma's mom, Naomi, never worked and was a real keeper of the hearth. They had an au pair. That's why their huge apartment was always shiny. Parents were often abroad, on duty father. Having met a few times in transportation, the guys decided to get acquainted. Both realized at once that their friendship would grow into something more. At first glance between the guys had little in common. Harvey was always simply dressed. Jeans, t-shirts, sneakers. In winter, a jacket always open and a knitted cap. Emma, on the other hand, was always dressed to the hilt. They grew up in families with different incomes and values, but this did not prevent the boys from spending a lot of time together. One day, Lucy met them in the street. Hello, young people. How are you? Looking at the girl, the woman asked. Good, I suppose. She tried to make her voice sound confident. She wanted Lucy to like her. Emma, this is my mom, Lucy. Mom, this is Emma. I told you about her. Yeah, yeah, I realized that's who you told me about. The girl was in a bad mood. She felt that she didn't like her future mother-in-law and immediately got down. What are you doing? Harvey asked her when her mom said goodbye and left. What a look your mom has. I think she saw the state of my liver. She didn't like me. The important thing is that I like you and we're gonna get married. I wouldn't be so sure after meeting your mom. My mom had a hard life. She buried her husband early and raised me alone. You told me that already. Emma stopped him nervously. You don't owe me an explanation. You don't owe me anything, Harvey. Things will be different in our relationship. There will be trust and love between us and he reached up to kiss her. But she made it his fault that his mother didn't like him. Harvey, don't. I don't want to. That's enough. I'm going home. Don't walk me home. I'll take a cab. Lucy was waiting for him at home, wanting to talk to him. How long have you known this girl? About six months. Why? You didn't like her and you couldn't even hide your displeasure. It's okay that I like her. You're not the one who's going to live with her, I am. Are you two that serious? Yes, it's serious. We love each other. I hope you're not getting married tomorrow. No, not tomorrow, but in a year when we graduate. Well, thank God, at least you were smart enough for that, said the woman and wishing her son good night, went to rest. Harvey went to the kitchen. It was there that the couch where he slept was located. It was so comfortable for him. When he was getting ready, he could have a snack and coffee if he needed to study longer to prepare for seminars. But today, he was resentful of his mom. Such blatant disrespect he didn't like. Today, he recognized a different side of her. And that surprised him. Harvey had always worked part-time. He couldn't sit on his mother's neck. Firstly, it was not manly, and secondly, he needed money to let modest gifts, but to please his green-eyed. One day he heard on the phone, as she advised her friend to buy a perfume, of which she herself is crazy about Christian Dior firm Miss Dewar. You will not regret the money spent, you will bathe in this fragrance and then it can never forget it. He wanted to surprise his beloved for New Year's Eve. Harvey had never been to such stores and at first he even stopped in front of the entrance, it was too pompous. But the desire to surprise Emma made him boldly take the handle of the door and enter the realm of fragrances, beautiful bottles, 
illuminated showcases, and a selection of beautiful girls. Seeing the dollar price tag surprised him, he smiled guiltily, and it separated Harvey and perfume forever. He went into that store one more time to look at that luxury, the stunning beauty of the bottles. He found Emma's favorite fragrance, the price tag has not changed since then $500, so wanted to ask if anyone buys such an expensive perfume, but was shy. He never came to this store again because he earned such money for two months fulfilling orders of the same poor guys. When there were no orders for programs, he worked as a courier. The money was paid immediately, which was also convenient. That's how he got by. He was not an excellent student, but a solid chorus that adorned his grade book. You just couldn't go any lower or you'd lose your scholarship. Emma could not work part-time. Her father is the head of a large enterprise, could provide for his favorite daughter, but she looked up to Harvey and worked part-time translating. She took simple texts, translated them and got her remuneration. The guys lived an interesting student life and dreamed of their wedding. They met chastely, which is a great rarity nowadays. He was afraid of offending her with his desire to possess her before they were married. Emma appreciated this very much and considered him a real man. She felt his tenderness, his love, his desire to please her. It was hard for him to express his love in words because words did not convey the depth of Harvey's feelings. So he would take her hand, look into those green lakes, and she would understand. Their hearts yearned more and more to merge with each other. They were living the same dream of marriage. Harvey had been saving for the wedding for a long time. He gave some of the money he earned to his mom, which made her eyes moist, and she called him the breadwinner. If daddy could see you, he'd be proud of you, son. Please don't make me out to be a superhero. I'm sure that's what all sons do who take care of their moms. She adored him. The son looked a lot like Billy, his father, Lucy's husband. The day came when the youngsters decided to introduce their parents. Presenting her hand for introduction to the master of the house, she said emphatically politely, Lucy is a widow. She recognized him at once. He hadn't changed much since Billy's passing. The man held her gaze for a moment and then immediately began to invite everyone to the table. Lucy noted the rich decoration of the apartment, the beautifully set table. Everything felt like a desire to show his unlimited possibilities. Seeing all this, Lucy believed even more that her son would have a hard time with such a woman. The son was enchanted by the girl and was in heaven, thinking that his Emma was the light in the window. But for the sake of justice, it should have been noted that their love was mutual. Emma blossomed from the warmth of the words of Shenka, whom she loved. At such moments, she remembered how it was with Nikolai. He was real. She had really married. He'd stood as a stone wall for his family. But today, men had replaced the stone with drywall, and things had become so unreliable. She woke up when her son put his hand on her palm. Mom, what are you thinking about? Oh, just a little girl thing, son. Nami was talking about France. She loved everything French. Perfume, cosmetics, wine, dishes. The glasses she had put on the table today were made of fine French glass. She wanted to drink to the happiness of the young people. The parents were preparing for the wedding, and the young people were engaged in the most pleasant thing, the choice of outfits, the bride's hair and wedding makeup. Emma chose the best salon in town. The price did not interest her, only if there were good masters. Later, when she sees herself in the mirror, she will say to the masters, Thank you, you're real magicians. They'll smile modestly and say, We didn't do anything special, it's our job. Then you're so beautiful, nature did everything for us. Emma thought that the money they took from her must have included those compliments too. The dress brought to the bride from France itself was dazzling. It didn't even have to be customized. It was as if the master had sat in the next room and suited for her. Emma, you, 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 you in general, it is stunning it admired bridesmaids dress the bride. You are so beautiful, just fantastic. Emma did not argue. She was pleased to hear from the girls such words of admiration. When all the questions on the wedding organization were solved, Lucy started to go home. Mom, what's your hurry? I'm going, son. Don't worry, I'll get there on my own. I'll call you a cab. My son was worried. Come on, I'll walk a bit, and she said goodbye and left. The weather was beautiful, perfect for reminiscing. She looked around and realized she was not far from the waterfront. 
That's fine, I'll breathe the river air, thought the woman and started to walk down to the water. Her memory brought her back to the events of 25 years ago. A quarter of a century had passed. God, how long ago was it? And had it been at all? Yes, it must have been if she's seen Harry. He looks good, and I must not look so good if he didn't recognize me. Oh, whatever. Recognize me. Didn't recognize me. It doesn't matter. They met at the Institute of Technology at the Department of Design and Technological Support of Machine Building Production. There weren't many girls in that department, five of them, the other 45 guys. Harry and Billy became instant friends. They were always arguing at recess, proving something to each other. The guys always invited girls from the teacher training institutes to the party, and this New Year's Eve party was no exception. Girls from the teacher training college came to it. Lucy smiled. It was nice to remember her youth, her first love. She felt tired and sat down on a bench. Billy had asked her to all the dances that evening. Harry stood alone until he saw her. The thoughtful, thin girl, whose brown eyes seemed huge in her pale face, stood waiting to be asked to dance, and when Harry asked her, she was embarrassed and frightened. That's when things started to turn around for them. His parents were abroad at the time, working there for three years. He was staying with his grandmother. Selena was a beautiful girl. She was brought up in an orphanage, lived in a communal room. She studied at a teacher's college, and to make a living she scrumped floors in two entrances. Her neighbors helped her as much as they could. They all loved this kind, soulful girl. Not often, but the four of them went for walks. Selena always clung to Harry and felt protected. The boy would stay overnight at her place, and Selena felt like they had a family. And so a year passed. Harry's parents returned, and at that moment she announced her pregnancy. How unfortunate! The young man thought. Maybe it's time to meet the parents, Selena asked cautiously. Let's not burden my parents right away. They just arrived, and I don't want to put problems on them. You think our child is a problem? She said apprehensively, realizing that his attitude didn't bode well. I thought you'd be happy to have a baby. Light, you can't hear me. He left the room with determination and slammed the door shut. She sensed something was wrong, but she couldn't guess the reason. Harry should tell her the reason. After all, they were doing so well, and he couldn't tell her that his parents not only didn't want to meet the girl, but they didn't want her as a relative either. Who did you get involved with? Some homeless orphanage girl. No family, no tribe. I understand what you were thinking while your mother was yelling, but you should have used your brains in between. You're not stupid. How can we show her to our acquaintances? She's a normal, nice girl. So what if she's in an orphanage? We're all under God. It's not her fault she went there. It's just the way things are. Harry, maybe I'm missing something, or maybe you're not telling me the truth. Is there any reason other than you've been together over a year? Yeah, she's expecting a baby. Well, let her have it, who cares? But it's my baby. That's why I'm waiting for him. He's your grandson or granddaughter. What makes you think it's your baby? These girls are very cunning. They'll hang someone else's baby without blinking an eye. That's not the case. I'm her first man, so I know it's mine. So, here's the deal. If you want to get married, live with her in her communal apartment. Don't ask for money, we won't give you a dime. You're the man you decide, or you dump her. Marry Naomi, the deputy minister's daughter, and you'll have everything. Think. He didn't call or visit Celine for a month. She cried at night and didn't know what to do. One day when she opened the door, Lucy saw her on the doorstep of her apartment. She asked to speak to Harry because she needed to know his decision. But Harry refused to talk, telling his friends to mind their own business. One of the neighbors suggested to Celine to write to the dean's office of the institute. Let them talk to him there in a manly way. But she, afraid that she could ruin his career, refused this option. Deciding to do everything themselves, the women went to a lawyer, Natalie, to write a proper letter and send it to the place of study of this scoundrel. She was long retired knew Selena well, felt sorry for her, and when she was approached with a request, decided to protect the girl. Harry came running the next day. Bitch, what did you do? He yelled across the apartment. What do you mean? Selena asked, almost whispering in fright. Why did you write a letter to the Institute? Do you think that's how you want to tie me to you? And that's what I saw and he showed the mother of his child a huge dummy. I didn't write anything, what letter? 
Well, someone did it at your request. Someone wanted to ruin my life. Then my mother was right about girls like you. Harry, but you've already ruined my life. How am I supposed to live? And it doesn't bother you that your child will live in poverty. It's not his fault he's got a daddy like that. I don't know who wrote that letter, but I'm sure it was the right thing to do. Get out of here. Her cheeks were burning, her eyes lightening. He didn't recognize his submissive Selena. The letter went into great detail. Harry stood in the dean's office like a spitfire. The boys from the group were crowding the door, and when Billy heard that his friend was rejecting the baby, saying it wasn't his, he opened the door and called him a scoundrel. Harry had to leave the institute, and only a year later, when things had calmed down and rolled in another, the boys never saw him again. Billy married Lucy after graduating from the institute. It was a student wedding fund, but not rich, but they did it with their own money. Billy was already working at the factory when Harry was appointed chief engineer and then director. They didn't see each other for a while, but when there was an accident in the shop where two people were hurt, Michaela blamed Billy for everything, demanding that he be put on trial and that no favors be given to him. Although witnesses said that the shop manager was not at work that day, he was at a meeting with the chief engineer, but it was difficult to change Mikhailov's mind. That night he became ill. The ambulance took a long time to arrive, but he waited for it, smiled, as if apologizing for disturbing and died. No matter how much the doctors tried to bring him back to life, they failed. So when Harvey told her that he was seeing Emma, she didn't want to believe that it was her father, albeit indirectly, who was responsible for her husband's death. She believed that by doing so, Harry had avenged Billy on the scoundrel. Lucy glanced at her watch and hurried home. The evening of reminiscence was over. Harry's time out of school had not been wasted. His mother and father had invited Naomi and her parents to visit. He didn't like the girl very much. Whereas Selena was a natural blonde, this one was a burly brunette, wasn't as fragile as the one he rejected, and didn't feel like protecting her at all. It took a couple months for Harry to get the urge to ask her out. Gradually, the young people got used to each other, meeting more often, and finally Harry kissed Nina for the first time. It seemed to him that his kiss was her first, because he had never kissed her before. That was a good thing, he encouraged himself. There were more questions if she'd done it skillfully. Then what would he be? He and Naomi had gotten married when Harry was in his last year of college. It was a lavish wedding. Ministers, deputy ministers, journalists, glossy magazine editors. There was a lot of noise and of course, Selena couldn't help but see it. Son, your daddy's a bastard, marrying a bag of money. She named her son Anthony. It was the name of her friend at the orphanage who always protected her. Three years after her marriage, Naomi confessed she was barren. They thought long and hard and decided to take a child from the orphanage. Well, Mom, you didn't want to see your grandson or granddaughter from an orphanage, and now you suggest taking a child from an orphanage. A complete stranger to me, and you don't even know who he was born to. Maybe from a bitter drunk or a drug addict. Other kids don't get there. You've ruined my life. The woman pressed her thin lips and felt guilty, but there was nothing she could do. Are you happy now? I have everything but happiness. Well, you love Naomi. She's a wonderful hostess, a good-looking woman. These things happen in life. The mother reassured her son. They were very lucky. The orphanage had a three-year-old girl whose parents had been killed in a car accident. Naomi's father, through his channels, learned that they were decent people. The mother taught a foreign language at school, and the father worked as an engineer at the factory. The little girl had no other relatives and the young couple adopted her. The name Anya was changed to Emma, and the girl began to grow up in the family without needing anything. The parents immediately agreed not to tell the child anything about her past. They're her parents, that's all. Now they're getting their little girl married and time flies by. And soon Naomi and Harry will have a new status, grandparents. When Emma and Harvey's wedding was in full swing, the bride and groom dance was announced. It is a beautiful tradition that demonstrates through the language of dance the feelings of the young ones for each other. Harvey immediately decided that they would dance their first wedding dance, because a wedding without a dance is like New Year's Eve without an olive ear salad, and it was a waltz. The first chords of the romantic melody sounded. The young wife put her hand in his, 
took her head back a little, straightened her back in one, two, three, one, two, three, and the young floated down the hall in the rhythm of the waltz. When the music ended, the young people pressed themselves against each other, and their first waltz as husband and wife was still playing in their heads. Lucy's only regret was that there was no Billy to rejoice over her happy son. Harry came up to her and asked her to dance. She was confused, but when she saw Harvey looking at them, she accepted. I recognized you, but not right away, her former friend said in her ear. Well, thank God, I thought you changed beyond recognition. Good guy you brought up. I'm glad that my daughter will have such a husband. He doesn't want any help. He does everything himself. A man? Good for you. Yeah, well, you weren't that kind of man when you needed one. I'm not gonna argue. I'm ashamed of what I did and I hate to think about it. Does your son know we know each other? No, I haven't told him yet. I'm still not quite sure if I should. The dance ended and Harry escorted the lady to her seat. Then many years ago, Celine had seen on the news and read in the papers that the deputy minister's daughter Naomi was marrying Harry, her Harry, who had professed his love for her and vowed to be there for her always. She recalled her state of mind at that moment. Kicking out her failed husband and father, Selena realized that she had been wrong about Harry. But why had she trusted him so easily? It seemed to her that he loved her. Then she realized that the key word seemed, because between the orphanage and the daughter of the deputy minister, he chose money and comfort. The subject is as old as the world. How many books have been written about gullible fools like her? and how many movies have been made. Today, she joins the ranks of the abandoned and fatherless. Why did she suddenly think it would be different for her? She's always been a cautious girl. Life has taught her not to trust people, and this time nothing stopped her. What to cry now? Now she should think about the baby and try to be a good mother if she could be a wife. Selena was taking Harry's betrayal to heart. When she was alone, the incessant and sometimes annoying advice of her neighbors could be heard in her ears. Don't worry, be patient. Everything will be fine. They soothed her. But how and in what way would it be fine? Everything around her was collapsing and this advice seemed to her like a mockery. She did not see not only the brightness, but on the contrary, faced even more problems. The pregnancy was easy and it gave her the opportunity to finish the third year of college. The labor was easy, but the baby was a loudmouth. He gave such nightly concerts and by morning he fell asleep. Therefore, the young mother fell off her feet and fell asleep next to her son as soon as he left for intermission. She also washed the floors. The old grandmothers at the entrance rocked the strother with the child. So the vacations passed, and it was necessary to return to study. She had six months left, and then the practice began. Selena's life was completely different from that of her friends from her college group. It was hard for them to understand her. Many condemned the girl for deciding to give birth without a husband, condemning herself to poverty and scaring away potential suitors. Many of her classmates had already married and lived happily with their husbands and small children, and Selena herself envied them kindly. They had a family, something she had never had in her life, but she had a son she loved and was willing to do anything she could for him. Only she could do too little. The whole neighborhood helped her. She had a little trouble with her grades, but she made it through the six-month shift. When she returned home, she wanted to howl with loneliness and longing, but she gathered her strength, wiped her tears, and came to her son with a smile. How many people are helping us, right, son? It's a sin to cry. There was no one to resent. She met Harry herself. No one pulled her into bed. She decided to give birth herself. So get it in sign for what we fought. As they say, her neighbors were helping her, but she knew that many people were judging her. The man she was willing to do anything for had cheated her and traded her handsome son for a woman with money. She didn't resent them. When Anthony was a year old, she decided to call Harry and tell him about her son. He's a father after all, and she wouldn't mind him hanging out with her son. Overcoming her pride and shame, she called, but he had changed his phone number a long time ago. Probably knew his ex could call. She even felt better. She wanted to tell him but she couldn't. But her heart was pounding as she dialed his number. Did she still love him, knowing he'd left her for someone else? No, that was a question she couldn't answer even to herself. Finally, her diploma was complete and she could work as a home educator as a governess. 
Anthony was much calmer, and she decided to advertise for people who wanted to prepare their children for school. Two people came forward. A neighbor picked up her son while she worked with the children. It was a different kind of money than mopping floors in the entryway, but she did not give up this work. The children she worked with were wonderful, especially Veronica. She picked up everything on the fly. Why didn't you bring slippers? It's cold and tight. Tell your mom to put them in a bag for you. I will. You won't forget. I don't have a mom. Daddy says she's far away in heaven watching me. There was regret and bewilderment in Selena's eyes. What could have happened to a young woman? When she opened the door to Veronica's dad, she reminded him about the second shoe. Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot. I'll be sure to bring them to the next class. Veronica said she didn't have a mom. Yes, she does. My Betty couldn't beat a disease that was stronger and more insidious than she was. We've been without her for two years. We're trying to get by. Veronica's doing great. I don't think you'll have any problems at school. Thank you so much for your daughter. She loves practicing with you. And when the girl was about to go to first grade and Selena was saying goodbye to her, they both had tears in their eyes. Thank you, Selena. I'll never forget you. I won't forget you. You're a good girl. You're gonna be fine. Selena, come and visit us on September 1st. We'll celebrate Knowledge Day. But I have a little son. I know, so come together. A week later, they sat together at the table, drank champagne, and congratulated Veronica on the beginning of the school year. Having gone through all the stages of the relationship from bouquet candy to a velvet box with a ring, Selena accepted Archie's proposal and married him. From ordinary gratitude to love is much less than one step, especially if it's little Anthony's step. For two years, Veronica's dad wooed Selena, but it was all decided by one word. One day her son had called Archie daddy. She had been very wary of this courtship. Now she wasn't alone and the responsibility was twofold. She had to make sure that not only she was happy, but also her son. Thinking that there was no more room for love in her heart, she kept burying herself for the mistake she had made many years ago. The scar remained for the rest of her life. Strangely, the memories of Harry were blurring with each passing day. She couldn't remember him well and even when she closed her eyes, wanting to visualize his image, it was her Anthony in front of her. The one man she would run after for the rest of her life. Her soul was mangled by pain, fear and hardship. And Archie was like a doctor treating, only his medicine was sweet, tasty and called love. Of course, she couldn't undo the mistakes of her youth, but she could avoid or minimize them. Long ago, she had given in to her feelings, lived with her heart, dissolved into her first love. Now her mind was involved in those feelings, and only when she realized that this was the man she wanted to live with for the rest of her life did her heart open, and she responded to Archie's feelings. They renovated the communal room and rented it out and moved into Archie's apartment. Her husband was the head of the legal department at the factory and earned a good salary. The apartment was three-roomed after the 18-meter communal room for Selena, it was a palace. For the first time in many years, Archie quietly went to work without worrying about Veronica and the house. The girl did not call Selena mommy and no one rushed her. The child remembered her mother perfectly well and could not call a stranger's aunt with this native word at once. Returning from school with Veronica, she bumped into Harry at the doorway. You? He asked in surprise. I answered Selena calmly. You live in this house? What did you think I lived in my uncle's cabin? No, of course not. Sorry, he couldn't take his eyes off the boy and only when the child hid behind Selena asked. Is that my son? That's my son. Trying not to give away her excitement, Selena replied. But she wasn't very good at it. Mine, you hear me? You didn't have him when you traded him for money and connections, and I didn't trade it for humiliation in front of you to get it back. Who's your husband? This house is mostly occupied by the plant's senior staff. My husband is the head of the legal department at the plant. She could have sent him away, but she wanted to see how he reacted. Archie? Yes, he's my husband and the father of these beautiful children. Harry looked at Selena and noted that the girl he had fallen in love with at first sight had grown into a beautiful adult woman. He was nervous, Selena saw it, and didn't understand why. After all, he had lived, slept, and loved for six years without being tormented by any pains of conscience or impulses of remorse. And now when he saw his son, he became nervous. 
He was unpleasant to her. She wrinkled her nose. We must go. Goodbye. And opened the door of the entrance and went into the house. The whole evening remembering this meeting, Harry walked around in a frenzy. His boy, his son, seemed happy around his mother. He found some resemblance to himself. The brunette hair, the nose. He was a sturdy boy, well-dressed. And his mom's eyes, big brown ones. So Archie married Selena. He'd heard good things about him. He remembered the dislike with which Selena's big brown eyes had looked at him. It never left him that Selene hated him. Because that's the way it is Harry answered to himself Harry deserved it. The table was set for dinner and Naomi called Harry over. I thought you weren't coming, said her wife. I've called you three times already. I'm not hungry, he replied, and closed himself in his study. He decided to sleep here tonight so that his wife wouldn't bother him with her questions. He dreamed of the first time he had seen Selena on New Year's Eve and asked her to dance. He took her hand, but a little boy grabbed Selena by the hem of her dress and shouted at her. Mommy, don't go dancing with him. He's bad. Harry opened his eyes and looked at the clock. It was two in the morning. He couldn't get any more sleep. He remembered that he had read a good expression about betrayal. But the author was unknown. Before you brazenly break someone's heart, wipe your feet on someone's feelings, remember, the cash register is somewhere ahead of you. You'll have to pay for everything. And he paid in full. He would never have any children of his own. In the morning, he drank a large cup of black coffee and went to work. They hadn't seen Sveta for a long time. And when they ran into each other again, she was holding a blue ruffled bundle. Congratulations on your son. Not necessarily. The last person I expect congratulations from is you. He looked at her enviously and only when the door slammed shut did he go to his room. It had been two years since Selena and Archie had had a son. Veronica had been calling Selena mom for a long time, telling her all her secrets, and Archie was happy. Serialsha went to first grade, and his older sister helped him with his lessons. One day, standing at the kitchen window, Selena saw Harry in the yard with a little girl, about three years old. She was funny with her legs, it seemed that she had been walking for a long time and the child was just tired. Where did this child come from? Did Harry have a girl? They've lived a long time for themselves, Selena thought and pulled back the curtain. Many years had passed since then. The little girl had managed to marry a nice guy, and Harry and Naomi soon became grandparents. Granddaughter Elizabeth was the main treasure on Selene. She was an affectionate, gentle child. However, Grandchildren are no different. Emma worked for a German company with a representative office in their town. Harvey was a specialist in computer technology. In the firm where he was hired to work, his duties included software and automation of production processes. The guys were getting a good deal and after two years they were able to move out of the rented apartment into their own three-room apartment, bought with the money they earned. When Elizabeth was five years old, something broke in their family life, so it seemed to Geneva. Everything seemed to be the same, but it wasn't. Emma began to get headaches more and more often, more and more often she was late at work, explaining that it was a heavy workload. You can't just pay money like that. Don't you know Germans? She justified herself. There was no reason not to believe her. Family is trust after all. He chased away the sad thoughts that came into his head every time Emma came home late from work. He would give a lot to bring peace and love back into the house. Harvey looked with bated breath at their wedding picture, at their happy faces. How much had changed since then? All these years he had tried to be a good husband and father. They had a wonderful relationship with their daughter. For some reason she told him and not her mom about her problems, and her dad solved them very quickly. For some reason she told her father, not her mother, about her first unhappy love for her neighbor Valka, who lived across the street. Perhaps not every woman can be a mother. Emma didn't make it. Tonight, he went to bed without his wife again. After calling her without any hope of hearing her voice, he lay staring at the ceiling. It was a strange night. It made him uneasy, and it made him think that he would never be able to live a normal life again. Such thoughts would never have occurred to him before. For seven years, he had had a beautiful family, and now what was he to his wife? He couldn't answer that question himself, and Emma skillfully avoided talking about it every time. Harvey got up in the morning and found Emma not at home. After sending his daughter to school, he drove to his wife's workplace. The pretty receptionist, doll-faced, 
said hello kindly and told him that Emma had quit. How could that be? We were surprised. She came in yesterday morning, put in her notice. Come on in, Julia will tell you all about it. He stood in front of the massive door of Julia's department head. Come in, she said in a well-smoked voice. Hello, I'm Emma's husband. I understand. Have a seat. Is she all right? Is she alive and well? Harvey asked with concern in his voice. What's going to happen to her? She's alive and well, in love with the translator Walter Meyer, with whom she left yesterday morning for Germany, Julia finished. Are you kidding? Harvey asked. Not at all. Are such words joking? I talked to her, but she wouldn't even listen to me. Here's the letter she left you. I asked her to write it, knowing that you would come to me and look me in the eye. And she handed him the sealed envelope. I don't think you should be sad. There's plenty of such goodness in our country. You'll meet a good woman. Maybe I will, but what am I gonna tell a seven-year-old? I'd be very surprised if you said she was a good, loving mother. I'm gonna go, Harvey said, and said goodbye. He wasn't going to discuss his family problems with a stranger. He got in his car and opened the envelope. Harvey, I'm going to Germany with Walter. We love each other and want to be together. I think Elizabeth has enough love from his grandparents and yours. We've never been close, so she won't notice my absence. I want to be happy. Goodbye and I'm sorry. I'll text or call my parents. Emma. He leaned on the steering wheel and didn't even notice he'd hit the horn until a security guard knocked on his window as he exited the office. Sorry, said Harvey and started the car. He had clearly underestimated his wife. She was a lot worse than he thought she was. All he cared about now was his daughter. What to tell the kid? If the mother didn't love her, the child was attached to her. He should have been at work a long time ago. Harvey drove the car, realizing he was worried. His hands on the wheel were shaking and he couldn't concentrate on the road. Not enough to leave a child orphan, the man thought, and stopped the car. He was circling the car when his phone rang. It was a co-worker, a friend, a good guy, Billy. Harvey, what's wrong? Where are you? There's a meeting today. You have to report on your project. Haven't you forgotten? He glanced at his watch, tensed, and answered briefly. I'll be right there. The first thing Elizabeth asked when Harvey came home from work was where mom was. Elizabeth, mom was sent on a business trip to Germany. And she didn't even tell you. Why not? I know where she is. It was just urgent and even unexpected. Someone got sick and mom had to fill in for that person. For how long? She said two months. So how long? Can we go to her place? I don't think so. Mom said something about a secret facility. They don't let anyone in there and they won't let mom out for a while. He told whatever he could think of, because the girl was very nervous and wanted to know as much as possible. After trying to convince her to wait, he reminded her of her lessons. Harvey was not finding it easy. In Emma's absence, daughter and father had grown even closer. After doing her homework, Elizabeth lay at her father's side and said, I think mommy has abandoned us. Why do you think that? She doesn't call us. She doesn't go online to talk to us. That means she doesn't want to see us. You're wrong. Mom's at work. Serious work. Secret. The child's face became sad. She kissed her father on the cheek and said she was going to bed. And sleep must have forgotten its way back to him. Emma's outburst had done its work. He lay there wondering how to go on. What to tell the child. She wasn't a fool to believe in secret work all the time. He could not explain, but at the name and deed of his wife. Everything raged inside with indignation and anger. I should consult my mother, Harvey thought. Turning his head to the other half of the bed where Emma had once lain, his heart ached. On the bedside table at her side, he saw a magazine. It was a regular glossy publication that told of all the gossip. At the end of the magazine, he saw the name E.M. made the meaning of the name. He found it interesting and started reading. He ran through the first lines quickly with his eyes. But from the part where the girlfriends dislike Emma, he started reading. Disliking Emma for her arrogance for sure, Harvey thought. She'd never had any girlfriends. The ones at the wedding were more likely to come not to her, but to find wealthy men. In addition, she tends to do something first and then think, which inevitably leads to many mistakes. That's what Harvey thought of my wife. The first marriage is often a failure. The second marriage may be to a foreigner. Emma's always the favor of the family, 
but less happy in adulthood and marriage. Harvey couldn't believe his eyes. Was this about all Emma's or his wife? It seemed so close to reality, Harvey wondered. When he opened his eyes in the morning, the magazine was still lying next to him, open on the page about the Emmas. After walking his daughter to school, he called his mom. Hi, mom. You can come over to my place after work today, but not to rush into anything. I need you for a long time. Harvey, you're scaring me. Did something happen? Yes, there is, and I need to talk to you. Is Elizabeth okay? Is she okay? Yes, she's at school. Will you come, mom? I will. Do you have dinner? Why don't I make you something? That'd be nice. Lucy arrived a little early, and when her son opened the door, she had dinner on the table. Grandma, this is so good. I love your roast. You're welcome, my dear. When Elizabeth ran away to do his homework, the son and his mother moved to the sofa, and he couldn't start talking for a long time. Lucy helped. Will you have time to consult with me while Emma's away? She won't be here anymore. His mother's eyes doubled in size, but she could ask nothing, so Harvey went on. She ran away to Germany with some Walter. She left me a note where she confessed that she loved this German, and Elizabeth had enough love from her grandparents. What am I to do? Mother sat there unable to utter a word. Harvey, seeing that she was confused, asked, I've been thinking all day today at work. How would you feel about me sending Emma's daughter greetings, some gifts, so she doesn't feel abandoned? I'll set up a page on the internet in Emma's name and write to her. How else can I help my little girl? It's the third day she's been walking around like she's in the water. Lucy didn't answer right away. She paced the kitchen and thought, digesting all the information and couldn't understand how a mother could abandon her child for a man, even if he was Walter. Then she sat down, took her son's hand and said, Son, you want to protect your daughter. Protect her from unpleasant experiences is understandable and worthy of a father. But don't protect her from reality. And if Emma comes back, then what? Mom will be the kindest, most loving and gentle mom in her daughter's eyes. I mean, she wrote her letters, sent her presents and greetings. Right? So, Harvey's nervous. What's your point? What I'm getting at is that you need to tell the kid the truth. Not all at once, just prepare her slowly. Let the two months you told her go by, and in that time, prepare the child. It'll be hard, I'll grant you, but it won't be a lie, even if it's to save her. Don't make excuses for Emma. The note clearly says she doesn't want Elizabeth. I think so. Mom, but in this advice, you're not feeling sorry for Elizabeth. You're telling her to cut the truth out of her uterus. Quite the opposite. I feel sorry for my granddaughter, and I want to protect her from double lies. If you're honest with your daughter, she'll appreciate it. And besides, you and I talked about what happens if Emma comes back, and what if she doesn't. You're gonna spend the rest of your life keeping these pages, giving gifts from your non-existent mom. I don't think that's right. She looked at her son and felt sorry for him. He even looked older, she thought. I'll probably sleep over at your place. It's closer to work than here. Harvey stood up, swaying from the information he had heard. Maybe mom was right, he asked himself but he couldn't answer that question yet. The two months given to him to make a decision were coming to an end. Harvey considered his mother's advice the most correct, but also the most difficult. After waiting for Elizabeth to come home from school, he finally sank down on the couch and felt tired, running around the apartment as if that would help him make a decision. Harvey was already waiting for her, leaning against the back of the couch, thus giving his back a rest, and watched with bated breath at the door. Elizabeth came in, but he had no time to say anything before she put her palms on his face and said, Now you will not dissuade me from saying that Mama has left us. There was nothing left for him to do but to add, I want my daughter. Don't worry, Dad. I love you very much and we'll manage together. You are very handsome, kind, wise, and the girl kissed him on the cheek. He did not hide his worries, gave free rein to his emotions and tears flowed from his eyes. Cry, Daddy. Men are ordinary people and experience the same as we women. Here Harvey could not smile at his smart daughter. He could not believe that everything had worked out so well, and he sees his girl completely calm and happy. Thank you, my daughter, for getting it right. We're really gonna make it. The closest people to each other should help each other, and you're the closest person I have. I love you. I love you too, Daddy. I'm going to tell you a secret that I wasn't going to share with you. 
but I'm going to tell you today to cheer you up. I've always loved you more than mommy. I felt that she was not very interested in me, and you always came to me and played. And I remember you used to read me fairy tales. She wrapped her warm hands around his neck and said like a grown woman, Let's go to lunch. Grandma Lucy brought her special roast yesterday. The man's soul became calm. There were butterflies flying and birds singing. Lucy went straight to her son's house after work. Her granddaughter opened the door. The cheerful dragon flea immediately ran to her room. Probably, so did not say anything thought the mother and went into the room well, what, so did not have the guts to tell the truth. Mother, you don't know how well everything turned out. Elizabeth knows everything and doesn't worry. Lucy said in astonishment, well, tell me. And Harvey told his mother everything in detail. Do you have anything to drink? She asked. Only vodka. That's wonderful. They drank a small drink for Elizabeth and then talked for a long time about how to go on living. Emma's parents called Harvey and apologized for the deed of their wayward daughter. Harvey, well, you do not deprive us of the opportunity to see Elizabeth, asked him. Of course I won't. Elizabeth loves you and misses you, so you can take her for the weekend if she wants to. Thank you so much. The parents were experiencing such a betrayal of their daughter, and Harry even threw such a hurtful phrase in his heart. That's what non-native blood means, and waving his hand, went to his office. Naomi thought it was a cobblestone in her garden and secretly wiped her tears. And Harvey and Elizabeth, since that day, as if a whole new life had begun. The man's heart slowly came away from the betrayal of his wife. After two years of absence from his wife, he decided to file for divorce. Trusting relationship with his daughter, the father valued very much. He tried to share with her his successes at work, and she told him her secrets but sometimes asked to Grandma Lucy to talk to her. Harvey understood that she was a girl and she might have quite girlish questions for her grandmother. He was only glad that Elizabeth had become so close to her grandmother, who would not teach her bad things. He sometimes looked at his sleeping daughter and admitted grudgingly that she looked like Emma, but he didn't stop loving her. Harvey looked at her, and in his heart, there was a strong feeling of guilt in front of the child for not being able to save the family. Once at work, he overheard a conversation between two girls, and one phrase cut him to the heart. From good men wives do not run away the lovers, that's where the dog is buried Harvey thought then. So there was something about him that didn't suit her. It seems that they did not know each other well. If the husband did not notice the dissatisfaction of his adored wife, and she didn't see fit to make any changes in their relationship. Apparently, that's what led to this outcome in the family relationship. As time went on, Elizabeth became an adult. Having finished the ninth grade, she decided on her profession. Now she wanted to become a doctor. The girl was serious about chemistry, mathematics, biology. Although in all subjects she studied on excellent. All three years, which remained before graduation, she tried to study hard, preparing to enter the medical school. On New Year's Eve, she brought a boy home. Daddy, I'd like you to meet Barry. Hello, Harvey. He looked at him and saw him as someone who wanted to take away what was most precious to him. Harvey turned to him. Barry, can Elizabeth spend New Year's Eve with me? With you where? Well, first at my house with my parents and then to a club. That's very interesting, but I'm not a parent. So Elizabeth shouldn't spend the New Year's Eve with me. Yeah, I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking. Maybe we'll do this. We'll celebrate New Year's Eve at your place and then we'll go to the club to dance. That way, no one gets hurt. Barry, am I remembering right? Yes. So, uh, here's the deal. Elizabeth and I will decide when, with whom, and where. Okay. Goodbye. Sorry again, and he's on his way out. Daddy. Can't you be a little nicer? No, you can't. I see him for the first time, and he starts dictating how I should celebrate New Year's Eve. Who is he? Your dad is alone, and he wants to be with his daughter, too. If I were you, I'd explain it to him, and you'd stand there and listen. You're not a speechless creature, are you? Am I wrong? You're right, Dad, but I've been with you all year, and I want to spend this holiday with my friends. Elizabeth, what's going on? Are we fighting now? Did I do something to offend you, or did you not like Barry? What should I say to her? That he can't bear to see these strange guys claiming his girl and dictating how he should celebrate New Year's Eve. Lucy called to wish her son a happy new year and she knew something was wrong. 
Is everything okay? You're not in a festive mood. The news that his daughter would celebrate New Year's Eve with a young man took him by surprise, although why should he be surprised? She was a mature, beautiful girl. Harvey didn't skimp on her outfits, so she was always well-dressed. There was no question of not allowing her to date a boy at all. More than anything else in Celine, the father was afraid of losing his daughter's trust, important to both of them. Harvey feared the inevitable, realizing that someday his adored daughter would leave him and start her own family. So he didn't tell Lucy about his fears. We're fine. We're getting ready for the holiday. We bought a tree. We're decorating it. Oh, son, who are you kidding? Will you come to our New Year's Eve party? I will if you invite me. Harvey, you should be thinking about your personal life instead of watching your daughter's every move. You're suffocating her with your love, and you can't do that. She's a sensible girl. Just loosen the reins a little. It won't make her love you less. If you strangle her, she'll hate you. She's going to spend New Year's Eve with some guy. Do you know him? Who is he? Where he lives? Who are his parents? No, I don't know. Then find out. It's easier to keep out than to act diplomatically. Keeping good relations with your daughter. I'll come over and talk to my granddaughter. Grandmother, as always, was helpful. Elizabeth, who's the boy you have with you? How long have you known him? Two months, maybe a little more. That's a bit short. And already you want to go to the club with him tonight. Grandma, he's a nice guy. He goes to our school. He's a year older than me. His grandparents live in our house. I haven't been to his house, though. So you don't know his parents? No, I don't. Lisa, you listen to me. I think with an unknown boy should not go to the club at night. Get to know him better. Meet his parents. If he's a smart guy, he'll understand you. But if he's stupid, you don't want him. You agree with me? Not really, Grandma. It's not like I'm going to marry him and he has to introduce me to his parents. What if he meets another girl tomorrow and introduces her to his parents? We're just in the same company and parents have nothing to do with it. Do you trust him that much? Grandma, we won't be alone. There's a group of us. A few people from our class and some from his. But you'll spend New Year's Eve with Dad. It's a family holiday. Grandma, it'll be fine. Dad's not worried. I almost had a fight with him for the first time today. But leave the address of his parents or grandparents. All right. Barry walked home with his head down. Why didn't Harvey like his proposal? It was a great idea. Hang out with everyone for a while, then go to the club. Well, his first suggestion was stupid, to say the least. To sit with his parents, as if Elizabeth's father wasn't a parent, he wondered, nay resented why her father was so worried about her he might change his mind about going with liska after all there are so many girls around who are ready to go wherever the first guy in the class calls them but no he was drawn to her to elizaveta with these thoughts he came home and locked himself in his room his parents immediately realized that his plan had failed miserably you were right olga said to her husband they probably sent him away he was too confident how could they say no to such a handsome man? And they turned him down. You know, I'm glad our son learned a lesson like that. He'll think with his head and not with the seat he's sitting on. Come on, go comfort him like only you can. Give him hope. I'm betting you. Well, he's in a bad mood for a holiday like this. His father came into the room. Barry was lying face down on the bed. And if it had been a girl, you would have thought she was crying. The man did not ask the reason for this mood but began his story, then wondered himself how he did it. You know, son, one boy like you now also fell in love with a girl. He fell in love with a girl for life. But her parents did not appreciate such an impulse of a young man, and with distrust let their daughter go out with this boy. He saved money on breakfast to treat his girl with ice cream, in the movie to take her to the last row to kiss her. And one day, they took a walk on the boardwalk and were late getting home. Then her mom said to this boy, Young man, how can I trust you with my daughter if you don't respect her at all? I asked you to be home at 10 o'clock p.m. and you came an hour late. If you can't do such a small thing for my daughter, you better find another girl. No, come to our house again. Barry stood up and looked at his father, wanting to ask what happened next. Then this hero had to apologize for being late and promise that it would never happen again. And the boy kept his word. No matter how much he wanted to go camping with the girl or stay late at the disco, 
they were always home exactly at 22.00. And the girl's mom, Maddie. Maddie, so this is my grandmother? Yes, son, that's your grandmother, and that girl's your mom, and that boy's a fool who thought he could have everyone at his feet. That's your dad. That's the way it is, Barry. So you're not the only one who's been in trouble. I've been in trouble, too. You're my son for a reason. It's nice to have a girl at home and growing up with love and someone to worry about her. I won't tell you what to do. You're a smart guy. You'll figure it out. Thank you, father. I understand. Well, good. Don't be sad. It's good to have smart, loving parents who will give you a clue when you need it. He lay there for a long time thinking about what to do to make Harvey realize that he was a reliable man and loved his daughter. Meeting back at the school, Barry asked Elizabeth what had happened there after he left. What happened? Grandma came, began to ask what's up. Daddy was offended and kept repeating why you did not take him for a parent. Well, all in all, it wasn't fun. Elizabeth, I'm sorry. I rushed into things, but I'll make it up to you. How? What are you going to do? Don't scare me. Don't be afraid. Everything will be fine. The next day in the evening, Barry went to Elizabeth's house. He was even glad that everyone was there. Elizabeth's father and grandmother all looked at him expectantly and were not going to help him with leading questions. He had made a mess of it himself, and he had to get out of it. The boy took a deep breath and said, Harvey, I apologize. I was wrong to impose my New Year's Eve wishes on you. If you think that Elizabeth doesn't know me much yet, and it's too early for her to go to the club with me all night, then if you don't mind, I'll stay with Elizabeth at your place. He fell silent and lowered his head. To support Barry, Elizabeth stood beside him and took his hand. Lucy decided to save the situation. I don't mind at all, and I'm even glad of your proposal, young man. You have decided very wisely. It's up to Papa, and she looked sternly at her son. She had just told him that it was time to take care of himself, not to look out of the window at Elizabeth every minute. I'm in for it, said a satisfied Harvey. But after New Year's Eve at home, her father let her go to the club with a promise to be home no later than four o'clock in the morning. You hear that, Barry, no later. Don't worry, Harvey, we won't be late. He waited for his daughter. It was exactly four o'clock when he and Barry reached the driveway and kissed goodbye. When did my little girl grow up? She's kissing already. He seems like a nice guy. He's got a sly rap, if you don't mind. Good for him. Elizabeth has good taste. He's handsome, tall, he's a sportsman. You can see his biceps from under his clothes. He did not meet his daughter. He did not want to show her that he waited and did not trust them. He fell right into a peaceful sleep, knowing his daughter was home. From then on, Barry became a frequent guest in the Procoro family. Sometimes the young people quarreled, not without it, but they quickly found a common language and made peace. Harvey liked the young man. They could in the evening, while Elizabeth did her homework, play chess, won another game. And it wasn't always possible for his father to beat Barry. He was a good thinker. He finished school a year earlier than Elizabeth and immediately entered medical school, wanting to continue the dynasty. He wanted to be a surgeon from childhood. A year later, Elizabeth entered the same school. She dreamed of becoming a pediatrician. Having cured all her dolls, she took on her grandmother and father assuring them that their lungs were not in order. Lucy obeyed the little doctor and her granddaughter liked it very much. Time flew inexorably, and now the house was preparing a big holiday. First of all, Elizabeth is 18, and secondly, she is a student. There were many guests. Elizabeth invited her school friends, and Barry, of course, came. The party was in full swing when the doorbell rang. I'll get it, said Harvey. In front of him stood his ex-wife, who had run away 11 years before. I'm here to wish my daughter a happy birthday. Can I come in? Why didn't you come to any of the other birthdays and call? Or because, as the song goes, once in a lifetime is 18 years, so I thought I'd check in. Daddy, who is it? Here, daughter. Another belated guest has arrived. I don't know if you'll remember her. The girl stood there and stared at Emma. Daughter, you didn't recognize me. It's me your mother and stretched out her arms and wanted to hug the girl. Elizabeth did not run away, but did not rush to the fugitive in an embrace. I brought you so many gifts, fashionable clothes. Come on, I'll show you everything. I have guests now. I'll go to them. Then we'll talk. Let's go in the kitchen. You want some tea? Harvey suggested it. 
Lucy wasn't so nice to her ex-sister-in-law. Oh, who would be missed? Something's gone wrong with our Emma to come running back. You never loved me or wanted your precious son to marry me. What's wrong? Right, you're very different from him. But my son loved you, so I never stood in his way. And I never turned him against you. And I'm grateful to you for my granddaughter. A smart and beautiful girl, she's my happiness. Why did you come here? To see my daughter, to wish her a happy birthday. She grew up without a mother after all. What kind of mother are you? Here's the mother and she pointed at her son. I always thought that God created woman to love and take care of children, husband, family. And looking at you, I don't even think that. You've always wanted freedom. So you could run away from your child with another man. You call yourself a mother. Please don't make me laugh. That's your truth, and my truth is different. I don't doubt that you will turn everything around and blame your husband, who was both dad and mom to your daughter for 11 years. You knew what kind of father Harvey had always been. That's why you ran away so calmly. You knew your daughter would be all right. The time was approaching 11 o'clock, and the guests began to leave. Barry was the last to leave, congratulating Harvey once more on the birthday girl. Elizabeth came into the kitchen. Let's talk, Emma. I'm not your Emma. I'm your mom. And where are you, mom? Eleven years were while dad was around if I was sick, took me to the sea, played, walked. Helped me do my homework. You said you brought me clothes and I don't need anything. You look at my wardrobe. Dad always bought the best. And I never missed you, said Elizabeth and cried. Daughter, I don't know what your father told you about me, but don't believe him. I'll tell you everything as it really was. You're an adult. You understand everything and you'll see for yourself who's right and who's wrong. I came for you. Do you know the opportunities in Germany? It's not your backwater. You'll see the world. See how beautiful people live. I know you'll love it. We'll sell the apartment and buy there. I have savings. Why are you looking at me so surprised? You say we'll sell the apartment. But dad, where will he live? On the street. Why on the street? He's coming with us. Don't you want to ask me if I'm going to Germany and especially with you? I have a very good job now. I'm the head of the department. You're the head of the department, for God's sake. You're a loser and a pauper. You can't see beyond your nose. You could be a millionaire in Germany, but here you're a pauper. Well, let's call it a night. It's getting late. I have to get up early for work tomorrow. Go to your parents' house for the night and we'll talk again tomorrow. I'm sure you didn't just come to congratulate your daughter. Emma said goodbye and slammed the door behind her. I'm going home too, Lucy said. I'll have to think about it. Harvey called his mother a cab and the apartment became so quiet, so peaceful after the guest, the music and the guitar songs. Thank you, Daddy, for such a holiday. My daughter hugged him and immediately remembered how, as a little girl, she calmed her father and assured him that they would manage, and they did. Emma went to her parents with a heavy heart. She didn't want to see them, let alone talk to them. She thought about staying the night in her apartment, but her ex-husband was determined. When she returned home after an 11-year absence, she was amazed to see what Elizabeth had become. The cute little girl had turned into a real beauty. 18 years old, a fine age when everything was still ahead of her. But what surprised Emma was her daughter's lack of arrogance about her appearance. She thought of her facial features and found a resemblance to herself. I wonder if she realizes what kind of impression she can make on men if she makes good use of what nature has given her, or if she's just as much of a bastard as her loser father, the woman thought angrily. And maybe it's good naivety. Lack of understanding of her beauty will make her even more desirable to men. They like that kind of woman. It will be necessary to introduce her to the right people in Germany. She can't sit in this swamp with her data. That's the way her mother thought. She stood at the door of the apartment she'd lived in for years. Why don't I see any resemblance between me and my parents? Emma suddenly thought, but at that moment the door was opened by her father. How did they greet you? Fanfare? Stop being so sarcastic. I see you're very pleased that Harvey practically kicked me out. You're my parents and you're supposed to support me. But what do you do? Support you for what? Your inappropriate behavior? Abandoning your child. And for whom? She liked the guy. What do you know? It's you who live your whole life without loving each other. You think I didn't see that? I also wonder how you could give birth to me. 
I must have been such a bitch because I wasn't the fruit of love that burns young people who've just got married. Your mother was still looking in your mouth, and you sure didn't love her. Shut up. What do you know about love if you couldn't even love your own daughter? You got a golden husband that many women more deserving than you wanted, and he fell in love with you. What could he find in an empty woman like you? I'm beautiful, smart, and many men wanted me, and I made him happy. Emma was startled by her father's wild laughter. His wife brought him a glass of water and sat him in a chair. Anyway, the money you're asking for, we don't have it. We never had it, not even when your grandfather was alive. And he was a deputy minister. My mom and I are retired. We live modestly, but we make do. Well, why do you need such a huge apartment? It's hard to clean and maintain. I'm entitled to that apartment too. Sell it and get a one bedroom and the money I get will be enough. If Harvey sells his, I'll be gone and you'll never see me again. You're crazy. Have you thought about where your daughter will live? Of course I have. I'm taking my daughter with me, so I can get my ex-boyfriend to sell the apartment and Harvey can go to his mother's. That's it. No one will be left on the street. I've got it all figured out. Naomi, can you hear what that crazy woman is saying? What a monster we've raised. I wish she'd stayed in an orphanage. Harry, shouted the wife. Yeah, yeah, I didn't misspoke. I'd rather have no children than a moral freak like that. We're the ones who raised her like that. We put her in every hole. Every order, remember, not a request, an order. Your father flew at rocket speed to fulfill, and this is the result. I just thank God that she could have given birth to our beautiful granddaughter. What orphanage are you talking about? And what does that have to do with me? Because you're not our real daughter, do you understand? We brought you up, educated you, married you, helped you while you worked, and now that's it. We don't owe you anything more. Forget about the apartment. It's only for Elizabeth. There's nothing for you here. Mom, is he crazy? What's he talking about? What orphanage? He's telling the truth. We took you from the orphanage when you were three years old. Your parents were in a car accident. Your mom was a foreign language teacher and your dad was an engineer. That's the truth. If your appetite hadn't grown to such obscene proportions, maybe you'd never have found out about your past, but you've really disappointed us. We may not be the best parents, but we certainly didn't deserve such rudeness. She helped her husband up and escorted him to the bedroom. Then she went to her daughter and gave her the jewelry box. This is all I can do for you. Your grandfather gave it to you, so consider it his help. Good night and Naomi, hunched over, went to rest. She had aged about 10 years since she had talked to her daughter, but she felt better after they had told her the truth. Emma sat absolutely dumbfounded by the news. I can see why they've been slow to help me. She looked at the jewels and realized that she could get very good money for them. Some were handmade, one of a kind. Her mood improved a little and her resentment lessened. Why all of it to Elizabeth? Lucy's apartment would be enough for her. Why two old people who were about to go to the grave anyway? But they would have done a good deed. She felt tired. Walter? Walter. The woman remembered her first days in Germany. It had been happiness, joy, hope for a cloudless future. But not everything had turned out so smoothly. And at the same time, it was banally simple. He was a gambler. She noticed it not at once, but when her jewelry, given by her parents and grandfather, began to disappear, she understood everything. She wanted to leave immediately, because she knew that such people do not recover, but only sink and drag others with them. But he swore that he would give up everything, that he loved her and would do anything to make her happy. How much money was spent on treatment, but it was enough for a year or two. And then he relapsed again. This time he was unlucky. Walter lost to serious people. He fell for the professionals and his cheating tricks, which he always used. They figured it out in a heartbeat. They took him away, beat him up, and for days she didn't even know where he was. Called everyone she knew, no one had seen him. It was only a week later that a young man showed up at her door and explained everything. Showing how much money he owed, he said that she, as a spouse, had to pay up. She'd of course had savings, and not small, but she wanted to get out of this situation with the least possible loss. She and Walter had a successful business together. Having drawn up all the papers for the transfer of the business to her and having asked those serious people to meet with him, the lawyer went to him. He told the poor man that Emma would help him out, but that he had to hand over the business to her and slid the documents to him to sign. 
Walter shrank back, realized that he had played the game, and signed everything with shaking hands. Now Emma had sole ownership of the business, but she had to pay off the debt. Walter's waiting for her help. She would have to push Harvey, and she would do it. She woke up by noon, but still felt tired. Her parents weren't home and Emma decided to look for the deeds to the apartment. She had one crazy thought. The papers were always in her father's study, in a folder labeled apartment, but they weren't there now. Maybe they hid them from me, Emma thought with a grin. Parents did not hide anything. They decided to go to the notary and write a will for the apartment for Elizabeth. It would be calmer, they said to each other. And after breakfast, they went to the notary's office. And Emma did not give up and looked in other places. But everything was in vain. Tired, she drank coffee, lay down some more and decided to go to Elizabeth's house. The door was not open for a long time, but when her daughter appeared in front of her, she could see that she had headphones in her ears. How long did you call? Elizabeth asked, addressing her mother in first name. Why are you yelling at me? I'm not a stranger to you. Get used to it. I don't like to hear it from you and she went into the room. Nothing's changed in 11 years. Even the furniture is old. Why can't my father update the look of the apartment? It's all stale. In Europe, they throw these things in the trash long ago, Emma said and said. And when she turned around, she saw Elizabeth sitting with her eyes closed, listening to music. No education, Emma thought, approaching her daughter and taking out her headphones. I came to talk to you. I want to suggest that you come with me to Germany. It's a different standard of living, different opportunities. You'll feel happy in the midst of this civilization. Let's go. You'll study there. You'll make new friends. How do you feel about that? Emma, but her mother interrupted her. I told you not to call me that. What don't you understand? Okay, although it's gonna be hard for me to do. You're basically a stranger to me. You weren't there for me during the most difficult moments of my life. And now you show up and call me to come with you and you're offended that I don't call you mom. My dad was my mom. When I was in third grade, my dad was shy about bathing me, so I would go to my grandmother's house or she would come to our house. I missed you guys, but I got used to it. I love my father very much. He is a deeply decent and kind man, and I'm not going to leave the United States for Germany. This deeply decent and kind man lied to me, humiliated me, and did everything to make you wean off your mom. How many letters I've written, how many tears I've shed, missing you. At that time, the door to the apartment opened and Harvey came in. The daughter and mother were talking loudly and they didn't hear the door click. Did you write me letters? Of course I did. And this decent man didn't give them to you. Harvey clenched his fists, but did not interrupt the conversation. The only reason I left was so he wouldn't take away my parental rights. Why would my adoring father want to do such a cruel thing to you? I think he got another woman. Dad, well, that's where you're overreacting. If there was a reason, I would have seen that woman, but there were no other women in this house during your absence, except for the grandmothers. You're just a kid. He was just going to her. You're a big girl and you realize that a man can't be without a woman for long, unless he's impotent. You've never had a man. You've never cheated on daddy. Harvey tensed, ready to come out of hiding at any moment. No way, I love Harvey. Still, it's strange what you're saying. Why did you have to go so far away? Harry's grandfather has such a fancy apartment, you could have lived there and seen me. I could have lived with you and dad. Why did you leave? And why did your dad want to terminate your parental rights? It's not like it's something you just do at will. Do you need a good reason? Emma didn't expect that question. She didn't expect such a serious conversation from her daughter. The woman thought it would be enough to tell her what a scoundrel her father was, that's all. But here her daughter was clearly stumping her with her questions. Wife was struggling with two feelings. To go into the room, take out the last letter of the note, and show it to the daughter so that she realizes everything, from the first to the last word of the mother, is a lie. And on the other hand, he would forever deprive Elizabeth of communication with Emma. For if the daughter knew the truth, his ex-wife's attempts to smear Harvey would fail. He hesitated. You have to understand, Elizabeth. I can't tell you everything. Or rather, you can't understand everything. The relationship between a man and a woman is a very complicated one. Emma, I must disappoint you. 
I probably would have believed you if I hadn't once found what's called your farewell letter in daddy's files. At that moment, the world called mom collapsed for me. I remembered that note by heart. Harvey, I'm going to Germany with Walter. We love each other and want to be together. I think Elizabeth has enough love from her grandparents and yours. We've never been close, so she won't notice my absence. I want to be happy. Goodbye and I'm sorry. I'll text or call my parents. Emma, you say you've never been with a man, so it wasn't your dad who made you leave. But you ran away from us, sorry, but I'll call it what it is, with a lover. And I really had enough love for my grandparents and especially my dad. After reading that note, I never thought of you again. So don't lie to me. And she put in her headphones to continue listening to music. Harvey came out of this hiding place and stared at Emma. Eyes wide open. You're even worse than I thought you were. Go on. Get out and don't show up here again. No, wait, buddy. This apartment we bought together and I'm entitled to my share. And if Elizabeth comes to Germany with me, then she and I are entitled to two shares in the apartment. But you can buy them from us, especially since I've advertised my share. If you want to live with a neighbor, be my guest. Elizabeth's not going anywhere with you. She's made that very clear to you. You don't need a daughter. For 11 years, you've done without her. You're a bad example for her. A phone call interrupted a heated conversation. Yes, come and see it. It's a three-room apartment. I'm waiting. What are you thinking? I'm not going to sell the apartment. I have a job here. My daughter's at school. What are you doing all of a sudden? I have a right to this apartment too. Hurry up, or you'll be living with strangers. I've been paying for your share for 11 years. It's been mine for a long time. You shouldn't have. I didn't ask you to do that. You didn't ask, but I didn't want to be deprived of our apartment for non-payment. That's why I paid. I consulted a lawyer. You're not entitled to anything here. Take your stuff and go back where you came from. Well, you're gonna regret this. A battle lost, but not a war, Emma said angrily and slammed the door of the apartment she hated. Unfortunately, she couldn't do anything, although she wanted to punish her ex for doing without her, for not persuading her to stay, and most importantly, for being able to earn her daughter's love and respect. She was angry that her savings would have to lose weight, all because no one was willing to help her, although in her own opinion, she was entitled to everything. After staying with her parents for a few more days, Emma left. The goodbye was dry, without hugs or kisses. When she opened the door and turned around, she looked at her parents, at her father, who was gray-haired, and at her mother, who was trying to prolong her youth and was dyeing her hair. She smiled indifferently and managed to say thank you and goodbye. Naomi cried, after all. For many years the girl had called her mom and she was happy to see the child grow up. Don't worry, you did your best. Harry smiled at his wife and began to reassure her that her daughter was on her feet and would not be lost. Let's go and have some tea, he said, putting his arm around his wife's shoulders and leading her into the kitchen. Despite the fact that there was no crazy love between the spouses, at least not on Harry's part, Emma was right. They had lived their lives calmly, respectfully, trying to support each other in times of need. Looking ahead, it must be said that Emma will never come to her parents again, and Elizabeth and Harvey will see them off on their last journey. After Emma left, father and daughter had a long secret conversation. Elizabeth told her father that for a moment she felt disappointed when she heard Emma's blatant lies and was glad she knew the truth. How did you find the letter? I had hidden it so far away. I don't know why I didn't tear it up and throw it away. It's not too late to do it tomorrow, lest your grandchildren read it. Daughter, your way of talking and reasoning make you look older, and that impression is even stronger when I look at your new hair go. But anyway, you're smart and beautiful. Let's not tell grandma about Emma coming, she'll get upset, feel sorry for me, pat me on the head, say I'm a poor kid, but I'm not poor at all, I'm the happiest. Though she looked like Emma, Harvey looked at her daughter and marveled at the thought that she had everything her mother did not. He never ceased to be amazed at her kindness, her decency, how much she knew. There was nothing ostentatious or contrived about her. His daughter was his pride. Meanwhile, Emma was landing at Frankfurt and Maine, Germany's largest airport. When she arrived home, she immediately called Walter's mother and explained everything that had happened to him. Frau Martha, I'm leaving. I don't want to live with your son anymore. 
I hope you will understand and not judge me. I did a lot to cure him, but I couldn't. I'm calling you so that when he arrives he won't start drinking and gambling again, making debts. You'll have to pay for him now. I'll leave him a letter explaining everything. I'm waiting for you. Then, after calling her lawyer, she asked him to go with her and be a witness to the transfer of the money. She decided to keep the jewelry and pay with her savings. She didn't want to rush into selling them. Toward evening, Frau Martha arrived. She was a tall, dry, typical German woman. Her blue eyes, faded with age, gave her appearance a somewhat intimidating look. The money for Walter had been handed over, he was promised to be released, and Emma was ready to leave. With a nod to Mrs. Martha, she got into a cab and never returned to the city again. A year later, Emma would marry a lawyer ten years older than herself. Their offices were next to each other, and God told them to pay attention to each other. They both escaped loneliness by complimenting each other. The energetic Emma, always in a hurry with one idea overtaking another. And Henry, calm, judicious, never making hasty decisions. Emma's life got better, she calmed down and even got a little better, which pleased her husband very much. The woman only scolded herself for having put up with this idiot, a slob who could not pull himself together and quit playing. It was probably the only time she thought about him. Emma remembered her daughter two years later, on her 20th birthday. She called to congratulate her. There was no conversation, because no one was waiting for her call. No one needed her. The woman was not upset but just balked at the fact that there were some distant relatives in the United States. Time ran inexorably forward and opening her eyes in the morning, Elizabeth realized that this was the last day of her life as a bride. Today, she would marry Barry and they would live happily ever after and die on the same day. The bride was finishing her degree, the groom his internship. They both didn't want to wait any longer. Studying at the same institute, they sought each other very seldom, Sometimes they could not meet for weeks. Barry studied in one building, Elizabeth in another, so they could only return phone calls. During this time, both realized they were jealous. Elizabeth was always in the thick of things on the course, so she was never alone. Barry didn't like it. It's impossible to catch you alone, always someone dragging you around. You don't suffer from loneliness either, and this gnat of yours is just glued to you. I don't give a damn about that gnat. I don't care whether she's there or not. Her plans are her problems. So they quarreled, and once they broke up for six months. It was at this point Elizabeth almost failed the session, but then pulled herself together and passed everything, but ashamed to say how. This time was remembered for the rest of her life. She, in general, did not expect to meet him ever again, but fate had its own plans. And the boys made up. Today was their wedding day, and tomorrow they would be husband and wife. Elizabeth smiled at these thoughts, not imagining herself in this new and difficult role. Still, it warned her to think about it, especially since she loved Barry. Strangely, her list of suitors was quite short. She didn't need anyone but this strong and reliable man. Harvey was worried too. He was giving his only daughter in marriage and preparing for his new status as father-in-law. He didn't know, of course, what kind of man he was and how he should behave with his son-in-law. But after thinking about it, he decided not to change anything about Barry. He liked the guy and he was giving him his daughter relatively, with a calm heart. There weren't very many guests. Girlfriends, friends of the guy's, relatives on one side and the other. A month ago, the parents had met and liked each other. That's important too. Still have to meet at family parties and it's nicer when they are nice people. It was still an hour before the party and the guests were already starting to gather. Harry and Naomi stood back and saw all the guests invited to the party. A large crowd was entering the hall, led by Celine, no longer Celine and Archie. He recognized his son immediately. Two young women were walking beside him, both laughing and he hugged them both. He apologized to his wife and stopped abruptly beside Celine. She frightenedly backed away from him and her spouse held her by the elbow. And Harry stared into those familiar brown eyes, huge eyes, Net wants his Selena's. I'm sorry I startled you. Can I talk to you for a few minutes? What's wrong? Selena asked unhappily. Is that my son? I told you years ago. He didn't let her finish. Yes, yes, I remember it's only your son. Yes, my Anthony. 
The woman admitted every word so Harry would realize he had a different father. You never give me the slightest hope of ever telling my son that I'm his father. Just as you took away that hope of happiness years ago by abandoning me to my fate. Yes, I did a terrible thing, but fate has punished me enough. We don't have kids. Naomi never had a baby. How not? And the girl you kept walking around the yard with? That's Emma, my foster daughter. We got her from the orphanage. Good for you. You've made one child happy. Tell me about your son. Who's with him? He's hugging two women at once. On the right is his wife, Victoria, and on the left is his sister, Veronica. And across from Anthony is my son, Alex, and his wife, Katie. And surrounding them are my grandchildren. What did Sergi become and where does he live? Sergi is a computer genius. He has his own company. His eldest son is a lawyer, married but no children yet. The youngest is finishing school and wants to work for his father. And the third girl. That's how big Sergi's family is. Doesn't he know Archie's not his own? Selena looked at him with regret. You still don't get it. Archie is the closest thing he has to family. He brought him up and made a man out of him. Sergi is a real man, responsible, provides for the family. He's the real head of the family. What's the use of being his biological father who forced his mother to have an abortion? That's not something a real father would do. So don't give yourself the idea that you're the father. Remember, you're nobody. She spoke harshly, taking pity on this already completely gray-haired man. I get it. Yeah, what side of the wedding are you invited to? The groom's side. What's that supposed to mean? That's what it means. Barry is my youngest Alex's son. What are you doing here I don't understand? Well, Elizabeth is my granddaughter, Emma's daughter. He looked at Selena and was frightened. She was standing there pale, open-mouthed and gasping for air. Oh my God, so you and I are related after all? It's a shame, but there's nothing I could have done. Barry's very fond of Elizabeth. I like her too. Yeah, where's your daughter? Harry immediately became sad, and although he had been preparing for this question, it still took him by surprise. She couldn't come, she was working abroad. You're lying again, Selena replied sharply, but I don't care about that. It's your family. Goodbye and stay away from mine. Harry looked for his wife with his eyes but couldn't find her. His legs were shaking and he sat down in the chair that stood in the hall. Closed his eyes to visualize his son once more. Harry, why are you crying? His wife asked him. Yes, I am crying. Not every day. Granddaughters get married again, you lie, said the man to himself, covering his eyes. We asked all the guests to go to the hall heard all the loud voice of the wedding organizer. The young people sat at the head of the table and were quite nervous. For them, this was a momentous day. It was their first and main love ball, which would be remembered forever and would open a new family life for them. Barry kept his eyes on Elizabeth. You're embarrassing me. Don't stare so hard. Who am I to look at? You're my wife now. And then you look so pretty in that wedding outfit. Toastmaster joked a lot, organized games, dances, let the chanting of bitter in general, worked hard. In the midst of the celebration, the door to the hall slowly opened and a woman entered it. Finding the one who had invited her, she walked briskly over to Casey. Casey, I'm sorry, I couldn't make it earlier, she sat down next to the woman. Harvey was watching. He didn't know this woman. He'd never seen her at his mother's. Who is she? And why is she at the wedding? Meeting his mother's gaze, he nodded and asked who it was. But Casey gave him a thumbs up from which Harvey realized that explanations lay ahead. The dancing part of the evening was opened by the young people with a beautiful waltz. The grandmother, looking at her granddaughter, wept and furtively crossed her lips, whispering something. And Harvey kept looking at the strange woman. She was about 35, a searing brunette, short in stature, stocky. Harvey liked her. He had long since forgotten that feeling, the pinching of his heart. As in his youth, it had been simple, but now he was in a stupor. He was struggling with two feelings. Go sit down. Why the fuck does she need you? The grandchildren will be here soon. And he turned sharply and went to the seat. But the inner voice was working, even on a holiday like this. Where are you going? Who are you trying to convince yourself or this woman that you had your day? How are you gonna live your life? Her daughter's married, it's time, and she cut the cord with you. She has a family of her own in which you will have a place, but a small one. He stopped, turned around abruptly, 
and before he could change his mind, took a quick step toward the woman. She was standing next to her mother and chatting sweetly. Can I invite you to dance? Looking at Ladaka and receiving approval, went to dance. Let's get acquainted completely daring, said Harvey. I'm Ariana. And I'm Harvey. I know you in absentia. Casey told me a lot about you. So I know more about you than you know about me. It's not fair. We need to correct that imbalance. I agree, Ariana smiled, baring her white teeth. She was even prettier up close. Beautiful eyes with fluffy lashes, sensual lips, and hair that fell in large waves over her shoulders that I wanted to run my fingers through. Oh, what bold thoughts you're having, the inner voice said. Harvey shuddered, but the voice praised him. Well done, that means you still have a man in you. You want a woman, which is natural, and she seems to want you. Harvey looked into Ariana's eyes and suggested we switch to you. With pleasure, the woman replied cheerfully. The music ended and immediately both were confused. Both had the same question swirling around in their minds. What's next? And let's drink to my favorite daughter, and then to acquaintance. That's a great idea. Casey was happy. She met this lovely woman on the boardwalk, walking alone. The woman's fate had not been easy. Her parents, authoritarian people, had divorced her husband, deciding that he was not suitable for her, and kept her to themselves until the last saying that she owed them everything. Ariana did not argue, but fulfilled her filial duty. When her parents didn't, she thought she was old. Casey brought her back to life and invited her to the wedding to introduce her to her son, who understood his mother's message correctly. God willing, they'll make it work. Looking toward her son, she saw a man and a woman happy with each other. Hearing the first bars of the music, Elizabeth invited her father to dance, a slightly graying man in an impeccable gray suit and his daughter in a gorgeous white dress swirled around the room in the rhythm of the tango. Barry didn't leave his mother without a dance either. Compared to the tall and athletic son, she seemed small and fragile, and at the end of the dance, pulling his mother off the floor, the son spun her around. Admiring Anthony, Harry kept his eyes on him. Mom, that gray-haired man over there keeps looking at me. Who is he? Yeah, no, you're imagining things. That's Elizabeth's grandfather. He doesn't know anybody around here. So he's looking at me. Never mind. Veronica came up to Anthony. Come on, brother. Let's dance or I'll be gone and I won't see you again for a long time. Veronica lived in Washington and worked in the newsroom as an illustrator. She met her future husband, the editor-in-chief, when she came to show her work for children's books. It was a fortunate coincidence when a hobby became a profession. The ability to draw was her gift. Her parents noticed it and did not ignore it, thinking about their daughter's future profession related to drawing. Life showed that they were right. Her drawings were put on the editor-in-chief's desk. So he fell in love, first with her work, and seeing a tall, slender girl, he fell in love with Veronica as well. Despite the important appearance of the editor-in-chief, he was pleasant and easy to talk to. Strong, muscular body, thick cap of hair, and a stunning smile charmed the girl and drove her crazy. After two months of dizzying romance, Veronica married Tony and never regretted it. He idolized her and promoted her on all fronts. She had orders for foreign books as well. After the birth of twins, Veronica a little withdrew from the business, but Gleb, taking a nanny, gave the young mother the opportunity to rest and little by little to do what she loved. Now the children were finishing school and were about to enter adulthood. How are you, sister? Sergi asked. I'm fine, you two. I see everything worked out. There, our children are communicating. We need to somehow, Sergi, that they see each other more often or all the family ties will be broken. I agree. We'll think of a better way to do it. He kissed her on the cheek and went to his wife. The time was approaching midnight and the guests began to disperse. A suite in the hotel was rented for the young couple. It was obvious that they were tired. Elizabeth was lying on her husband's shoulder and was eager to take a shower and rest. Selena saw Harry and his wife come upstairs, but before he left he looked in her direction and mentally said goodbye. As she looked after him, she let go of all resentment and forgave him. Surprisingly, she felt better immediately. She was grateful to him that he did not ruin her life with Nikita, did not sue, for the opportunity to see her son and let God decide the rest. She was not without sin. 
Harvey called a cab, took his mother home first, then Ariana, but before he left he arranged a meeting. He felt good with that woman, relaxed. In a year, Harvey would propose to her and they'd be married. In two years, he'd be a second-time dad and grandfather. What wonders life has to offer. Elizabeth and Barry will soon move in with Anthony, who will help with Barry's job and the apartment. Life is beautiful and it continues in our children and grandchildren. To see them grow up, we should decide before they are born that a child should be loved and accepted for what it is, not to break it, not to make it the center of the universe, but to respect it. Then, in our old age, we will have children and grandchildren, and we will have a peaceful and happy old age, because parents feel good when their children feel good.